Chapter One of Mrs. Skaggs, Husbands, and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Bolka. Mrs. Skaggs, Husbands, and Other Stories by Bret Hart. Chapter One, Part One west the sun was rising in the foothills but for an hour the black mass of sierra eastward of angels had been outlined with fire and the conventional morning had come two hours before with the down coach from placerville the dry cold dewless california night still lingered in the long canyons and folded skirts of table mountain even on the mountain road the air was still sharp and that urgent necessity for something to keep out the chill which sent the barkeeper sleepily along his bottles and wine glasses at the station obtained all along the road perhaps it might be said that the first stir of life was in the bar rooms a few birds twittered in the sycamores at the roadside but long before that glasses had clicked and bottles gurgled in the saloon of the mansion house this was still lit by a dissipated-looking hanging lamp, which was evidently the worse for having been up all night, and bore a singular resemblance to a faded reveller of angels, who even then sputtered and flickered in his socket in the armchair below it, a resemblance so plain that when the first level sunbeam pierced the window-pane, the barkeeper, moved by a sentiment of consistency and compassion, put them both out together. Then the sun came up haughtily. When it had passed the eastern ridge it began, after its habit, to lord it over angels, sending the thermometer up twenty degrees in as many minutes, driving the mules to the sparse shade of corrals and fences, making the red dust incandescent, and renewing its old imperious aggression on the spiked bosses of the convex shield of pines that defended table mountain thither by nine o'clock all coolness had retreated and the outsides of the upstage plunged their hot faces in its aromatic shadows as in water it was the custom of the driver of the wingdom coach to whip up his horses and enter angels at that remarkable pace which the woodcuts in the hotel bar-room represented to credulous humanity as the usual rate of speed of that conveyance at such times the habitual expression of disdainful reticence and lazy official severity which he wore on the box became intensified as the loungers gathered about the vehicle and only the boldest ventured to address him it was the honorable judge b swinger member of assembly who to-day presumed perhaps rashly on the strength of his official position any political news from below bill he asked as the latter slowly descended from his lofty perch without however any perceptible coming down of mien or manner not much said bill with deliberate gravity the president of the united states hasn't been hisself since you refused that seat in the cabinet the general feeling in political circles is one of regret irony even of this outrageous quality was too common in angels to excite either a smile or a frown bill slowly entered the bar-room during a dry dead silence in which only a faint spirit of emulation survived you didn't bring up that agent of rothschilds this trip asked the barkeeper slowly by way of vague contribution to the prevailing tone of conversation no responded bill with thoughtful exactitude he said he couldn't look into that claim at johnson's without first consulting the bank of england the mr johnson here alluded to being present as the faded reveller the barkeeper had lately put out and as the alleged claim notoriously possessed no attractions whatever to capitalists expectation naturally looked to him for some response to this evident challenge he did so by simply stating that he would take sugar in his and by walking unsteadily toward the bar as if accepting a festive invitation to the credit of bill 
be it recorded that he did not attempt to correct the mistake, but gravely touched glasses with him, and, after saying, Here's another nail in your coffin, a cheerful sentiment, to which, And a hair all off your head, was plainly added by the others, he threw off his liquor with a single dexterous movement of head and elbow, and stood refreshed. Hello, old Major, said Bill, suddenly setting down his glass. Are you there? It was a boy, who, becoming bashfully conscious that this epithet was addressed to him, retreated sideways to the doorway, where he stood beating his hat against the doorpost with an assumption of indifference that his downcast but mirthful dark eyes and reddening cheek scarcely bore out. Perhaps it was owing to his size, perhaps it was to a certain cherubic outline of face and figure, perhaps to a peculiar trustfulness of expression, that he did not look half his age, which was really fourteen. Everybody in Angels knew the boy, either under the venerable title bestowed by Bill, or as Tom Islington, after his adopted father. His was a familiar presence in the settlement, and the theme of much local criticism and comment. His waywardness, indolence, and unaccountable amiability, a quality at once suspicious and gratuitous in a pioneer community like Angel's, had often been the subject of fierce discussion. A large and reputable majority believed him destined for the gallows. A minority, not quite so reputable, enjoyed his presence without troubling themselves much about his future. To one or two, the evil predictions of a majority possessed neither novelty nor terror. "'Anything for me, Bill?' asked the boy, half mechanically, with the air of repeating some jocular formulary perfectly understood by Bill. "'Anything for you?' echoed Bill, with an overacted severity equally well understood by Tommy. "'Anything for you?' No, and it's my opinion there won't be anything for you as long as you hang around bar rooms and spend your valuable time with loafers and bummers. Git! The reproof was accompanied by a suitable exaggeration of gesture. Bill had seized a decanter, before which the boy retreated still good-humouredly. Bill followed him to the door. Dern my skin, if he hasn't gone off with that bummer Johnson, he added as he looked down the road. "'What's he expecting, Bill?' asked the barkeeper. "'A letter from his aunt. Reckon he'll have to take it out in inspecting. Likely they're glad to get shut of him.' "'He's leading a shiftless, idle life here,' interposed the member of assembly. "'Well,' said Bill, who never allowed anyone but himself to abuse his protégé, "'seeing he ain't expecting no office from the hands of an enlightened constituency,' It is rather a shiftless life. After delivering this Parthian arrow with the gratuitous twanging of the bow to indicate its offensive personality, Bill winked at the barkeeper, slowly resumed a pair of immense bulgy buckskin gloves, which gave his fingers the appearance of being painfully sore and bandaged, strode to the door without looking at anyone, called out, All aboard! with a perfunctory air of supreme indifference whether the invitation was heeded, remounted his box and drove stolidly away. Perhaps it was well that he did so, for the conversation at once assumed a disrespectful attitude towards Tom and his relatives. It was more than intimated that Tom's alleged aunt was none other than Tom's real mother, while it was also asserted that Tom's alleged uncle did not himself participate in this intimate relationship to the boy to an extent which the fastidious taste of angels deemed moral and necessary. Popular opinion also believed that Islington, the adopted father, who received a certain stipend ostensibly for the boy's support, retained it as a reward for his reticence regarding these facts. "'He ain't ruining himself by wasting it on Tom,' said the barkeeper who possibly possessed positive knowledge of much of Islington's disbursements. But, at this point, exhausted nature languished among some of the debaters, and he turned from the frivolity of conversation to his severer professional duties. It was also well that Bill's momentary attitude of didactic propriety was not further excited by the subsequent conduct of his protégé. For by this time Tom, 
half supporting the unstable Johnson, who developed a tendency to occasionally dash across the glaring road, but checked himself midway each time, reached the corral which adjoined the mansion house. At its farther extremity was a pump and horse trough. Here, without a word being spoken, but evidently in obedience to some habitual custom, Tom led his companion. With the boy's assistance, Johnson removed his coat and neckcloth, turned back the collar of his shirt, and gravely placed his head beneath the pump spout. With equal gravity and deliberation, Tom took his place at the handle. For a few moments only the splashing of water and regular strokes of the pump broke the solemnly ludicrous silence. Then there was a pause in which Johnson put his hands to his dripping head, felt of it critically as if it belonged to somebody else, and raised his eyes to his companion. "'That ought to fetch it,' said Tom, in answer to the look. "'If it don't,' replied Johnson, doggedly, with an air of relieving himself of all further responsibility in the matter. "'It's got to. That's all.' If it referred to some change in the physiognomy of Johnson, it had probably been fetched by the process just indicated. The head that went under the pump was large and clothed with bushy, uncertain-colored hair. The face was flushed, puffy, and expressionless, the eyes injected and full. The head that came out from under the pump was of smaller size and different shape, the hair straight, dark, and sleek, the face pale and hollow-cheeked, the eyes bright and restless. In the haggard, nervous ascetic that rose from the horse trough, there was very little trace of the Bacchus that had bowed there a moment before. Familiar as Tom must have been with the spectacle, he could not help looking inquiringly at the trough, as if expecting to see some traces of the previous Johnson in its shallow depths. A narrow strip of willow, alder, and buckeye, a mere dusty raveled fringe of the green mantle that swept the high shoulders of Table Mountain, lapped the edge of the corral. The silent pair were quick to avail themselves of even its scant shelter from the overpowering sun. They had not proceeded far before Johnson, who was walking quite rapidly in advance, suddenly brought himself up and turned to his companion with an interrogative, Eh? I didn't speak, said Tommy quietly. Who said you spoke? said Johnson, with a quick look of cunning. In course you didn't speak, and I didn't speak neither. Nobody spoke. What makes you think you spoke? He continued, peering curiously into Tommy's eyes. The smile which habitually shone there quickly vanished as the boy stepped quietly to his companion's side and took his arm without a word. In course you didn't speak, Tommy, said Johnson, deprecatingly. You ain't a boy to go for to play an old soaker like me. That's what I like you for. That's what I seed in you from the first, I says. That ere boy ain't going to play you, Johnson. You can go your whole pile on him, when you can't trust even a barkeep. That's what I said, eh? This time, Tommy prudently took no notice of the interrogation, and Johnson went on. If I was to ask you another question, you wouldn't go to play me neither, would you, Tommy? No, said the boy. If I was to ask you, continued Johnson, without heeding the reply, but with a growing anxiety of eye and a nervous twitching of his lips. If I was to ask you, for instance, if that was a jackass rabbit that just passed, eh? You say it was or was not, as the case may be. You wouldn't play the old man on that. No, said Tommy quietly. It was a jackass rabbit. If I was to ask you, continued Johnson, if it were, say, for instance, a green hat with yellow ribbons, you wouldn't play me and say it did, unless, he added with intensified cunning, unless it did. No, said Tommy. Of course I wouldn't. But then, you see, it did. It did? It did, repeated Tommy stoutly. A green hat with yellow ribbons, and, and, a red rosette. I didn't get to see the rosette, 
said Johnson, with slow and conscientious deliberation, yet with an evident sense of relief. But that ain't saying it weren't there, you know, eh? Tommy glanced quietly at his companion. There were great beads of perspiration on his ashen gray forehead and on the ends of his lank hair. The hand which twitched spasmodically in his was cold and clammy. The other, which was free, had a vague, purposeless, jerky activity, as if attached to some deranged mechanism. Without any apparent concern in these phenomena, Tommy halted, and seating himself on a log, motioned his companion to a place beside him. Johnson obeyed without a word. Slight as was the act, perhaps no other incident of their singular companionship indicated as completely the dominance of this careless, half-effeminate, but self-possessed boy over this doggedly self-willed, abnormally excited man. "'It ain't the square thing,' <laughs> said Johnson, after a pause, with a laugh that was neither mirthful nor musical, and frightened away a lizard that had been regarding the pair with breathless suspense. "'It ain't the square thing for jackass rabbits to wear hats, Tommy. Is it, eh?' "'Well,' said Tommy, with unmoved composure, "'sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Animals are mighty queer.' And here Tommy went off in an animated, but I regret to say utterly untruthful and untrustworthy account of the habits of California fauna, until he was interrupted by Johnson. "'And snakes, eh, Tommy?' said the man, with an abstracted air, gazing intently on the ground before him. "'And snakes,' said Tommy. "'But they don't bite, at least not the kind you see. There, don't move, Uncle Ben, don't move.' Well, they're gone now, and it's about time you took your dose. Johnson had hurriedly risen as if to leap upon the log, but Tommy had as quickly caught his arm with one hand while he drew a bottle from his pocket with the other. Johnson paused and eyed the bottle. If you say so, my boy, he faltered as his fingers closed nervously around it. Say when, then. He raised the bottle to his lips and took a long draught, the boy regarding him critically. When? said Tommy suddenly. Johnson started, flushed, and returned the bottle quickly. But the color that had risen to his cheek stayed there. His eye grew less restless, and as they moved away again, the hand that rested on Tommy's shoulder was steadier. Their way lay along the flank of Table Mountain, a wandering trail through a tangled solitude that might have seemed virgin and unbroken but for a few oyster cans yeast powder tins and empty bottles that had been apparently stranded by the first low wash of pioneer waves on the ragged trunk of an enormous pine hung a few tufts of gray hair caught from a passing grizzly but in strange juxtaposition at its foot lay an empty bottle of incomparable bitters the chef d'oeuvre of a hygienic civilization emblazoned with the arms of an all-healing republic the head of a rattlesnake peered from a case that had contained tobacco, which was still brightly placarded with the highly colored effigy of a popular dasses. And a little beyond this the soil was broken and fissured. There was a confused mass of roughly hewn timber, a straggling line of sluicing, a heap of gravel and dirt, a rude cabin, and the claim of Johnson. Except for the rudest purposes of shelter from rain and cold, the cabin possessed but little advantage over the simple savagery of surrounding nature. It had all the practical directness of the habitation of some animal, without its comfort or picturesque quality. The very birds that haunted it for food must have felt their own superiority as architects. It was inconceivably dirty, even with its scant capacity for accretion. It was singularly stale, even in its newness and freshness of material. Unspeakably dreary, as it was in shadow, the sunlight visited it in a blind, aching, purposeless way, as if despairing of mellowing its outlines or of even tanning it into color. The claim worked by Johnson in his intervals of sobriety was represented by half a dozen rude openings in the mountainside 
with the heaped-up debris of rock and gravel before the mouth of each. They gave very little evidence of engineering skill or constructive purpose, or indeed showed anything but the vague, successively abandoned essays of their projector. Today they served another purpose, for as the sun had heated the little cabin almost to the point of combustion, curling up the long dry shingles, and starting aromatic tears from the green pine beams. Tommy led Johnson into one of the larger openings, and with a sense of satisfaction threw himself panting upon its rocky floor. Here and there the grateful dampness was condensed in quiet pools of water, or in a monotonous and soothing drip from the rocks above. Without lay the staring sunlight, colorless, clarified, intense. For a few moments they lay resting on their elbows in blissful contemplation of the heat they had escaped. "'What do you say?' said Johnson, slowly, without looking at his companion, but abstractly addressing himself to the landscape beyond. "'What What do you say to two straight games for one thousand dollars?' "'Make it five thousand, replied Tommy, reflectively, also to the landscape. "'And I'm in.' "'What do I owe you now?' said Johnson, after a lengthened silence. "'One hundred and seventy-five thousand two hundred and fifty dollars,' replied Tommy, with business-like gravity. "'Well,' said Johnson, after a deliberation commensurate with the magnitude of the transaction, "'if you win, call it a hundred and eighty thousand round. Where's the curds?' They were in an old tin box in a crevice of a rock above his head. They were greasy and worn with service. Johnson dealt, albeit his right hand was still uncertain, hovering, after dropping the cards, aimlessly about Tommy, and being only recalled by a strong nervous effort. Yet, notwithstanding this incapacity for even honest manipulation, Mr. Johnson covertly turned a knave from the bottom of the pack with such shameless inefficiency and gratuitous unskillfulness that even Tommy was obliged to cough and look elsewhere to hide his embarrassment. Possibly for this reason the young gentleman was himself constrained, by way of correction, to add a valuable card to his own hand, over and above the number he legitimately held. Nevertheless, the game was unexciting, and dragged listlessly. Johnson won. He recorded the fact and the amount with a stub of pencil and shaking fingers in wandering hieroglyphics all over a pocket diary. Then there was a long pause, when Johnson slowly drew something from his pocket and held it up before his companion. It was apparently a dull red stone. F, said Johnson, slowly, with his old look of simple cunning. If you happen to pick up such a rock as that, Tommy, what might you say it was? Don't know, said Tommy. Mightn't you say, continued Johnson cautiously, that it was gold or silver? Neither, said Tommy promptly. Mightn't you say it was quicksilver? Mightn't you say that if there were a friend of yours and as knew where to go and turn out ten ton of it a day? and every ton worth two thousand dollars that he had a soft thing a very soft thing allowing tommy that you use such language which you don't but said the boy coming to the point with great directness do you know where to get it have you struck it uncle ben johnson looked carefully around i have tommy listen I know where there's cartloads of it, but there's only one other specimen, the mate to this here, that's above ground, and that's in Frisco. There's an agent coming up in a day or two to look into it. I sent for him, eh? His bright, restless eyes were concentrated on Tommy's face now, but the boy showed neither surprise nor interest. Least of all did he betray any recollection of Bill's ironical and gratuitous corroboration of this part of the story. Nobody knows it, 
continued Johnson, in a nervous whisper. Nobody knows it but you and an agent in Frisco. The boys work around here, passes by, and sees the old man grubbing away, and no signs of color, not even rotten quartz. The boys loafing around the mansion house sees the old man lying round free in bar rooms, and they laughs and says, played out, and specs nothing. Maybe you think to expect something now, eh? queried Johnson suddenly, with a sharp look of suspicion. Tommy looked up, shook his head, threw a stone at a passing rabbit, but did not reply. "'When I first set eyes on you, Tommy,' continued Johnson, apparently reassured, "'the first day you came and pumped for me, an entire stranger, and have a no call to do it, I says, "'Johnson, Johnson,' says I, Here's a boy you can trust. Here's a boy that won't play you. Here's a chap that's white and square. White and square, Tommy. Them's the very words I used. He paused for a moment, and then went on in a confidential whisper. You want capital, Johnson, says I, to develop your resources, and you want a partner. Capital you can send for. But your partner, Johnson? Your partner is right here, and his name, it is Tommy Islington. Them's the very words I used. He stopped and chafed his clammy hands upon his knees. It's six months ago since I made you my partner. There ain't a lick I've struck since then, Tommy. There ain't a handful of earth I've washed. There ain't a shovelful of rock I've turned over, but I thought of you. Share and share alike, says I. When I wrote to my agent, I wrote equal for my partner, Tommy Islington. He have no call to know if the same was man or boy. He had moved nearer the boy, and would perhaps have laid his hand caressingly upon him, but even in his manifest affection there was a singular element of awed restraint and even fear, a suggestion of something withheld even his fullest confidences, a hopeless perception of some vague barrier that never could be surmounted. He may have been at times dimly conscious that in the eyes which Tommy raised to his there was thorough intellectual appreciation, critical good humor, even feminine softness, but nothing more. His nervousness somewhat heightened by his embarrassment, he went on with an attempt at calmness which his twitching white lips and unsteady fingers made pathetically grotesque. There's a bill of sale in my bunk made out according to law, of an equal undivided half of the claim, and the consideration is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, gambling debts, gambling debts from me to you, Tommy, you understand? Nothing could exceed the intense cunning of his eye at this moment. And then there's a will. A will? said Tommy, in amused surprise. Johnson looked frightened. Eh? he said hurriedly. What will? Who said anything about a will, Tommy? Nobody, replied Tommy, with unblushing calm. Johnson passed his hand over his cold forehead, wrung the damp ends of his hair with his fingers, and went on. Times when I'm took bad, as it was today, the boys about here says, you says maybe, Tommy, it's whiskey. It ain't, Tommy. It's poison. Quicksilver poison. That's what's the matter with me. I'm salviated. Salviated with mercury. I heard it before, continued Johnson, appealing to the boy. And as a boy of promiscuous reading, I reckon you have too. Them men as works in Cinnabar sooner or later get salviated. It's bound to fetch him some time. Salviated by mercury. What are you going to do for it? asked Tommy. When the agent comes up, and I begins to realize in this here mine, said Johnson, contemplatively, I goes to New York. I says to the barkeep of the hotel, show me the biggest doctor here. He shows me. I says to him, salivated by mercury, a year standing, how much? 
he says. Five thousand dollars. I take two of these pills at bedtime, and an equal number of powders at meals, and come back in a week. And I goes back in a week, cured, and signed a certificate to that effect. Encouraged by a look of interest in Tommy's eye, he went on. So I gets cured, and I goes to the barkeep, and I says, Show me the biggest fashion-blessed house that's for sale here. And he says, The biggest naturally belongs to John Jacob Baster. And I says, Show him. And he shows him. And I says, What might you ask for this here house? And he looks at me scornful and says, Go away, old man. You must be sick. And I fetches him one over the left eye, and he apologizes, and I gives him his own price for the house. I stocks that house with mahogany furniture and provisions. And thar we lives, you and me, Tommy, you and me. The sun no longer shone upon the hillside. The shadows of the pines were beginning to creep over Johnson's claim, and the air within the cavern was growing chill. In the gathering darkness his eyes shone brightly as he went on. Then there comes a day when we gives a big spread. We invite governors, members of Congress, gentlemen of fashion, and the like. And among em, I invites a man as holds his head very high, a man I once knew. But he doesn't know I knows him, and he doesn't remember me. And he comes and he sits opposite me, and I watches him. And he's very airy, this man, and very chipper. And he wipes his mouth with a white handkerchief, and he smiles, and he catches my eye, and he says, A glass of wine with you, Mr. Johnson. And he fills his glass, and I fills mine, and we rises. And I he's that wine, glass and all, right in his damn grinning face. And he jumps for me, for he is very game, this man, very game. But some of them grabs me. And he says, Who be you? And I says, Skaggs! Damn you, Skaggs! Look at me! Give me back my wife and child! Give me back the money you stole! Give me back the good name you took away! Give me back the health you ruined! Give me back the last twelve years! Give them to me, damn you, quick! Before I cuts your heart out! And naturally, Tommy, he can't do it! And so I cuts his heart out, my boy! I cuts his heart out! The purely animal fury of his eye suddenly changed to cunning. You think they hangs me for it, Tommy, but they don't. Not much, Tommy. I goes to the biggest lawyer there, and I says to him, Salviated by Mercury. You hear me? Salviated by Mercury. And he winks at me, and he goes to the judge, and he says, This here unfortunate man isn't responsible. He's been salviated by Mercury. And he brings witnesses. You comes, Tommy. And you says how you see me look bad before. And the doctor, he comes. And he says it's how he see me frightful. And the jury, without leaving their seats, brings in a verdict of justifiable insanity, salviated by Mercury. In the excitement of his climax, he had risen to his feet, but would have fallen had not Tommy caught him and led him into the open air. In this sharper light there was an odd change visible in his yellow-white face, a change which caused Tommy to hurriedly support him, half leading, half dragging him, toward the little cabin. When they had reached it, Tommy placed him on the rude bunk or shelf, and stood for a moment in anxious contemplation of the tremor-stricken man before him. Then he said rapidly, "'Listen, Uncle Ben, I'm going to town. To town, you understand?' for the doctor. You're not to get up or move on any account till I return, do you hear? Johnson nodded violently. I'll be back in two hours. In another moment he was gone. For an hour Johnson kept his word. Then he suddenly sat up and began to gaze fixedly at a corner of the cabin. From gazing at it he began to smile. From smiling at it he began to talk. From talking at it, he began to scream. From screaming, he passed to cursing and sobbing wildly. Then he lay quiet again. He was so still that to merely human eyes he might have seemed asleep or dead. 
but a squirrel that, emboldened by the stillness, had entered from the roof, stopped short upon a beam above the bunk, for he saw that the man's foot was slowly and cautiously moving toward the floor, and that the man's eyes were as intent and watchful as his own. Presently, still without a sound, both feet were upon the floor and then the bunk creaked and the squirrel whisked into the eaves of the roof. When he peered forth again, everything was quiet, and the man was gone. An hour later, two muleteers on the Placerville Road passed a man with disheveled hair, glaring bloodshot eyes, and clothes torn with bramble and stained with the red dust of the mountain. They pursued him when he turned fiercely on the foremost, rested a pistol from his grasp, and broke away. Later still, when the sun had dropped behind Payne's Ridge, the underbrush on Deadwood Slope crackled with a stealthy but continuous tread. It must have been an animal whose dimly outlined bulk, in the gathering darkness, showed here and there in vague but incessant motion. It could be nothing but an animal whose utterance was at once so incoherent, monotonous, and unremitting. Yet, when the sound came nearer, and the chaparral was parted, it seemed to be a man, and that man, Johnson. Above the baying of phantasmal hounds that pressed him hard and drove him on, with never rest nor mercy, above the lashing of a spectral whip that curled about his limbs, sang in his ears, and continually stung him forward, above the outcries of the unclean shapes that thronged about him, he could still distinguish one real sound, the rush and sweep of hurrying waters. The Stanislaus River, a thousand feet below him, drove its yellowing current. Through all the vacillations of his unseated mind he had clung to one idea, to reach the river, to lave in it, to swim it if need be, but to put it forever between him and the harrying shapes, to drown forever in its turbid depths the thronging specters, to wash away in its yellow flood all stains and color of the past. And now he was leaping from boulder to boulder, from blackened stump to stump, from gnarled bush to bush, caught for a moment and withheld by clinging vines, or plunging downward into dusty hollows, until, rolling, dropping, sliding, and stumbling, he reached the river bank, whereon he fell, rose, staggered forward, and fell again with outstretched arms upon a rock that breasted the swift current. And there he lay as dead. A few stars came out hesitatingly above Deadwood Slope. A cold wind that had sprung up with the going down of the sun fanned them into momentary brightness, swept the heated flanks of the mountain, and ruffled the river. Where the fallen man lay there was a sharp curve in the stream, so that in the gathering shadows the rushing water seemed to leap out of the darkness and to vanish again. Decayed driftwood, trunks of trees, fragments of broken sluicing, the wash and waste of many a mile, swept into sight a moment and were gone. All of decay, wreck, and foulness gathered in the long circuit of mining camp and settlement, all the dregs and refuse of a crude and wanton civilization, reappeared for an instant, and then were hurried away in the darkness and lost. No wonder that, as the wind ruffled the yellow waters, the waves seemed to lift their unclean hands toward the rock whereon the fallen man lay, as if eager to snatch him from it too, and hurry him toward the sea. It was very still. In the clear air a horn blown a mile away was heard distinctly. The jingling of a spur and a laugh on the highway over Payne's Ridge sounded clearly across the river. The rattling of harness and hoofs foretold for many minutes the approach of the Wingdom coach, that at last, with flashing lights, passed within a few feet of the rock. Then, for an hour, all again was quiet. Presently the moon, round and full, lifted herself above the serried ridge and looked down upon the river. 
At first the bared peak of Deadwood Hill gleamed white and skull-like. Then the shadows of Payne's Ridge cast on the slope slowly sank away, leaving the unshapely stumps, the dusty fissures, and clinging outcrop of Deadwood Slope to stand out in black and silver. Still stealing softly downward, the moonlight touched the bank and the rock, and then glittered brightly on the river. The rock was bare, and the man was gone, but the river still hurried swiftly to the sea. "'Is there anything for me?' asked Tommy Islington, as, a week after, the stage drew up at the mansion house, and Bill slowly entered the bar room. Bill did not reply, but, turning to a stranger who had entered with him, indicated with the jerk of his finger the boy. The stranger turned with an air half of business, half of curiosity, and looked critically at Tommy. "'Is there anything for me?' repeated Tommy, a little confused at the silence and scrutiny. Bill walked deliberately to the bar, and, placing his back against it, faced Tommy with a look of demure enjoyment. "'If,' he remarked slowly, "'if a hundred thousand dollars down and a half a million in perspective is anything, Major, there is!' End of chapter 1, part 1「Chapter One of Mrs. Skagg's Husbands and Other Stories by Bret Hart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Skagg's Husbands, Part Two, East. It was characteristic of angels that the disappearance of Johnson and the fact that he had left his entire property to Tommy thrilled the community but slightly in comparison with the astounding discovery that he had anything to leave. The finding of a cinnabar load at Angel's absorbed all collateral facts or subsequent details. Prospectors from adjoining camps thronged the settlement. The hillside for a mile on either side of Johnson's claim was staked out and preempted. Trade received a sudden stimulus, and in the excited rhetoric of the weekly record, a new era had broken upon angels. On Thursday last, added that paper, over five hundred dollars was taken in over the bar of the mansion house. Of the fate of Johnson there was little doubt. He had been last seen lying on a boulder on the river bank by outside passengers of the Wingdom night coach, and when Finn of Robinson's Ferry admitted to have fired three shots from a revolver at a dark object struggling in the water near the ferry, which he suspicioned to be a bear, the question seemed to be settled. Whatever might have been the fallibility of his judgment, of the accuracy of his aim, there could be no doubt. The general belief that Johnson, after possessing himself of the muleteer's pistol, could have run amuck, gave a certain retributive justice to this story, which rendered it acceptable to the camp. It was also characteristic of Angel's that no feeling of envy or opposition to the good fortune of Tommy Islington prevailed there. That he was thoroughly cognizant from the first of Johnson's discovery, that his attentions to him were interested, calculating, and speculative, was, however, the general belief of the majority a belief that, singularly enough, awakened the first feelings of genuine respect for Tommy ever shown by the camp. "'He ain't no fool. Yuba Bill see that from the first, said the barkeeper. It was Yuba Bill who applied for the guardianship of Tommy after his accession to Johnson's claim, and on whose bonds the richest men of Calaveras were represented. It was Yuba Bill also, when Tommy was sent east, to finish his education, accompanied him to San Francisco, and before parting with his charge on the steamer's deck, drew him aside and said, If at any time you want any money, Tommy, over and above your allowance, you can write. But if you'll take my advice, he added, with a sudden huskiness mitigating the severity of his voice, 
you'll forget every darn old spavined string halted bummer as you ever met or knew at angels every one tommy every one and so boy take care of yourself and and god bless you and particularly damn me for a first-class a one fool it was yuba bill also after this speech glared savagely around walked down the crowded gangplank with a rigid and aggressive shoulder picked a quarrel with his cabman and after bundling that functionary into his own vehicle took the reins himself and drove furiously to the hotel it cost me said bill recounting the occurrence somewhat later at angels it cost me a matter of twenty dollars afore the judge the next morning but you can bet high that i taught them frisco chaps something new about driving i didn't make it lively to montgomery street for about ten minutes oh no and so by degrees the two original locators of the great cinnabar load faded from the memory of angels and calaveras knew them no more in five years their very names had been forgotten in seven the name of the town was changed in ten the town itself was transported bodily to the hillside and the chimney of the union smelting works by night flickered like a corpse light over the site of johnson's cabin and by day poisoned the pure spices of the pines even the mansion house was dismantled and the wingdom stage deserted the highway for a shorter cut by quicksilver city only the bared crest of deadwood hill as of old sharply cut the clear blue sky and at its base as of old the stanislaus river unwearied and unresting babbled whispered and hurried away to the sea a midsummer's day was breaking lazily on the atlantic there was not wind enough to move the vapors in the foggy offing but where the vague distance heaved against a violet sky there were dull red streaks that growing brighter presently painted out the stars soon the brown rocks of grayport appeared faintly suffused and then the whole ashen line of dead coast was kindled and the lighthouse beacons went out one by one and then a hundred sail before invisible started out of the vapory horizon and pressed toward the shore it was morning indeed and some of the best society in grayport having been up all night were thinking it was time to go to bed for as the sky flashed brighter it fired the clustering red roofs of a picturesque house by the sands that had all that night from open lattice and illuminated balcony given light and music to the shore it glittered on the broad crystal spaces of a great conservatory that looked upon an exquisite lawn where all night long the blended odors of sea and shore had swooned under the summer moon but it wrought confusion among the colored lamps on the long veranda and startled a group of ladies and gentlemen who had stepped from the drawing-room window to gaze upon it it was so searching and sincere in its way that as the carriage of the fairest miss gillyflower rolled away that peerless young woman catching sight of her face in the oval mirror instantly pulled down the blinds and nestling the whitest shoulders in grayport against the crimson cushions went to sleep how haggard everybody is rose dear you look almost intellectual said blanche masterman i hope not said rose simply sunrises are very trying look how that pink regularly puts out mrs brown robinson hair and all the angels said the count de nougat with a polite gesture toward the sky must have find these celestial combinations very bad for the toilet they're safe and white except when they sit for their pictures in venice said blanche how fresh mr islington looks it's really uncomplimentary to us i suppose the sun recognizes in me no rival said the young man demurely but he added i have lived much in the open air 
and require very little sleep. How delightful, said Mrs. Brown Robinson, in a low, enthusiastic voice and a manner that held the glowing sentiment of sixteen and the practical experience of thirty-two in dangerous combination. How perfectly delightful! What sunrises you must have seen! And in such wild, romantic places! How I envy you! My nephew was a classmate of yours, and has often repeated to me those charming stories you tell of your adventures. Won't you tell some now? Do. How you must tire of us and this artificial life here. So frightfully artificial, you know? In a confidential whisper. And then to think of the days when you roamed the great west with the Indians and the bisons and the grizzly bears. Of course you have seen grizzly bears and bison. Of course he has, dear, said Blanche, a little pettishly, throwing a cloak over her shoulders and seizing her chaperone by the arm. His earliest infancy was soothed by bisons and he proudly points to the grizzly bear as the playmate of his youth. Come with me, and I'll tell you all about it. How good it is of you, she added, sotto voce, to Islington, as he stood by the carriage. How perfectly good it is of you to be like those animals you tell us of, and not know your full power. Think with your experiences and our credulity what stories you might tell. And are you going to walk? Good night, then. A slim, gloved hand was frankly extended from the window, and the next moment the carriage rolled away. Isn't Islington toying away a chance there? said Captain Merwin on the veranda. Perhaps he couldn't stand my lovely aunt's superadded presence. But then, he's the guest of Blanche's father, and I dare say they see enough of each other as it is. But isn't it a rather dangerous situation? For him, perhaps, although he's awfully old and very queer. For her, with an experience that takes in all available men in both hemispheres, ending with Nugat over there, I should say a man more or less wouldn't affect her much anyway. Of course, he laughed, these are the accents of bitterness, but that was last year. Perhaps Islington did not overhear the speaker. Perhaps, if he did, the criticism was not new. He turned carelessly away and sauntered out on the road to the sea. Thence he strolled along the sands toward the cliffs, where, meeting an impediment in the shape of a garden wall, he leaped it with a certain agile, boyish ease and experience, and struck across an open lawn towards the rocks again. The best society of Greyport were not early risers, and the spectacle of a trespasser in an evening dress excited only the criticism of grooms hanging about the stables, or cleanly housemaids on the broad verandas that in Greyport architecture dutifully gave upon the sea. Only once, as he entered the boundaries of Cliffwood Lodge, the famous seat of Renwick Masterman, was he aware of suspicious scrutiny. But a slouching figure that vanished quickly in the lodge offered no opposition to his progress. Avoiding the pathway to the lodge, Islington kept along the rocks until reaching a little promontory and rustic pavilion. He sat down and gazed upon the sea and presently an infinite peace stole upon him. Except where the waves lapped lazily the crags below, the vast expanse beyond seemed unbroken by ripple, heaving only in broad ponderable sheets, and rhythmically as if still in sleep. The air was filled with a luminous haze that caught and held the direct sunbeams. In the deep calm that lay upon the sea, it seemed to Islington that all the tenderness of culture, magic of wealth, and spell of refinement 
that for years had wrought upon that favored shore had extended its gracious influence even here. What a pampered and caressed old ocean it was, cajoled, flattered, and faded where it lay, an odd recollection of the turbid Stanislaus hurrying by the ascetic pines, of the grim outlines of Deadwood Hill, swam before his eyes, and made the yellow-green of the velvet lawn and graceful foliage seem almost tropical by contrast. And looking up, a few yards distant, he beheld a tall slip of a girl gazing upon the sea. Blanche Masterman. She had plucked somewhere a large fan-shaped leaf, which she held parasol-wise, shading the blonde masses of her hair and hiding her gray eyes. She had changed her festal dress, with its amplitude of flounce and train, for a closely fitting half-antique habit, whose scant outlines would have been trying to limbs less shapely, but which prettily accented the graceful curves and sweeping lines of this Greyport goddess. As Islington rose, she came toward him with a frankly outstretched hand and unconstrained manner. Had she observed him first? I don't know. They sat down together on a rustic seat, Miss Blanche facing the sea, and shading her eyes with the leaf. "'I really don't know how long I have been sitting here,' said Islington, "'or whether I have not been actually asleep and dreaming. It seemed too lovely a morning to go to bed. But you?' From behind the leaf it appeared that Miss Blanche, on retiring, had been pursued by a hideous winged bug which defied the efforts of herself and made to dislodge. Odin, the spitz dog, had insisted upon scratching at the door, and it made her eyes red to sleep in the morning, and she had an early call to make, and the sea looked lovely. "'I'm glad to find you here, whatever be the cause,' said Islington, with his old directness. "'Today, as you know, is my last day in Greyport, and it is much pleasanter to say good-bye under this blue sky than even beneath your father's wonderful frescoes yonder. I want to remember you, too, as part of this pleasant prospect which belongs to us all, rather than recall you in anybody's particular setting. I know, said Blanche, with equal directness, that houses are one of the defects of our civilization but I don't think I ever heard the idea as elegantly expressed before. Where do you go? I don't know yet. I have several plans. I may go to South America and become president of one of the republics. I am not particular which. I am rich. But in that part of America which lies outside of Greyport, it is necessary for every man to have some work. My friends think I should have some great aim in life, with a capital A. But I was born a vagabond, and a vagabond I shall probably die. I don't know anybody in South America, said Blanche languidly. There were two girls here last season, but they didn't wear stays in the house, and their white frocks never were properly done up. If you go to South America, you must write to me. I will. Can you tell me the name of this flower which I found in your greenhouse? It looks much like a California blossom. Perhaps it is. Father bought it of a half-crazy old man who came here one day. Do you know him? Islington laughed. <laughs> I am afraid not. But let me present this in a less business-like fashion. Thank you. Remind me to give you one in return before you go. Or... Will you choose yourself? They had both risen as by common instinct. Goodbye. The cool, flower-like hand lay in his for an instant. Will you oblige me by putting aside that leaf a moment before I go? But my eyes are red, and I look like a perfect fright. Yet, after a long pause, the leaf fluttered down and a pair of very beautiful but 
Withal very clear and critical eyes met his. Islington was constrained to look away. When he turned again, she was gone. Mr. Islington, sir. It was Chalker, the English groom, out of breath with running. Seeing you alone, sir. Beg your pardon, sir, but there's a person. A person? What the devil do you mean? Speak English. No, damn it, I mean don't said islington snappishly i said a person sir beg pardon no offence but not a gent sir in the library a little amused even through the utter dissatisfaction with himself and vague loneliness that had suddenly come upon him islington as he walked toward the lodge asked why isn't he a gent no gent begging your pardon sir would guy a man in service sir takes me and so sir as i sits in a rumble at the gate and puts em down so sir and says put em in your pocket young man or is it a road agent you expects to see that you holds up your hands hands crosses em like to that says he hold hard says he on the short curves or you'll bust your precious crust says he and asks for you sir this way sir they entered the lodge. Islington hurried down the long Gothic hall and opened the library door. In an armchair in the center of the room, a man sat apparently contemplating a large, stiff yellow hat with an enormous brim that was placed on the floor before him. His hands rested lightly between his knees, but one foot was drawn up at the side of his chair in a peculiar manner. In the first glance that Islington gave, the attitude, in some odd, irreconcilable way, suggested a break. In another moment, he dashed across the room, and, holding out both hands, cried, "'Yuba Bill!' The man rose, caught Islington by the shoulders, wheeled him round, hugged him, felt of his ribs like a good-natured ogre, shook his hands violently, laughed, and then said, somewhat ruefully, and how did you ever know me seeing that yuba bill evidently regarded himself as in some elaborate disguise islington laughed and suggested that it must have been instinct and you said bill holding him at arm's length and surveying him critically you to think to think a little cuss no higher nor trace a boy as i flicked out of the road with a whip time and again a boy has never had much clothes to speak of turned into a sport islington remembered with a thrill of ludicrous terror that he still wore his evening dress turned continued yuba bill severely turned into a restaurant waiter a garçon hey alphonse bring me a patty de foie gras and an omelette demi <laughs> dear old chap said islington laughing and trying to put his hand over bill's bearded mouth but you you don't look exactly like yourself you're not well bill and indeed as he turned toward the light bill's eyes appeared cavernous and his hair and beard thickly streaked with gray maybe it's this here harness said bill a little anxiously when i hitches on this here curb he indicated a massive gold watch chain with enormous links and mounts this morning star he points to a very large solitaire pin which had the appearance of blistering his whole shirt front it kind of weighs heavy on me tommy otherwise i'm all right my boy all right but he evaded islington's keen eye and turned from the light you have something to tell me bill said islington suddenly and with almost brusque directness out with it bill did not speak but moved uneasily toward his hat you didn't come three thousand miles without a word of warning to talk to me of old times said islington more kindly glad as i would have been to see you it isn't your way bill and you know it we shall not be disturbed here he added in reply to an inquiring glance that bill directed to the door and i am ready to hear you firstly then said bill drawing his chair nearer islington 
Answer me one question, Tommy. Fair and square, and up and down. Go on, said Islington, with a slight smile. If I should say to you, Tommy, say to you today, right here, you must come with me. You must leave this place for a month, a year, two years, maybe, perhaps forever. Is there anything that'd keep you? Anything, my boy, as you couldn't leave? No, said Tommy quietly. I am only visiting here. I thought of leaving Greyport today. But if I should say to you, Tommy, come with me on a pacer to China, to Japan, to South America, perhaps. Could you go? Yes, said Islington, after a slight pause. There isn't anything, said Bill, drawing a little closer and lowering his voice confidentially. Anything in the way of a young woman? You understand, Tommy? As would keep you? They're mighty sweet about here. And whether a man is young or old, Tommy, there's always some woman as his break or a whip to him. In a certain excited bitterness that characterized the delivery of this abstract truth, Bill did not see that the young man's face flushed slightly as he answered, No. Then listen. It's seven years ago, Tommy, that I was working one of the pioneer coaches over from Gold Hill. As I stood in front of the stage office, the sheriff of the county comes to me. And he says, Bill, says he, I've got a loony chap as I'm in charge of, taking him down to the asylum and stopping. He's quiet and peaceful, but the insides don't like to ride with him. Have you any objection to giving him a lift on the box beside you? I says, no, put him up. When I came to go and get up on that box beside him, that man, Tommy, that man sitting there, quiet and peaceful, was Johnson. He didn't know me, my boy. Yuba Bill continued, rising and putting his hands on Tommy's shoulders. He didn't know me. He didn't know nothing about you, nor angels, nor the Quicksilver Lord, nor even his own name. He said his name was Skaggs, but I knowed it was Johnson. There was times, Tommy, you might have knocked me off that box with a feather. There was times when it was twenty-seven passengers at that stage that found themselves swimming in the American River five hundred feet below the road. I never could have explained it satisfactorily to the company. Never. The sheriff said, Bill continued hastily, as if to preclude any interruption from the young man, the sheriff said he had been brought into Murphy's camp three years before, dripping with water and suffering from percussion of the brain, and he had been cared for generally by the boys around. When I told the sheriff I knowed him, I got him to leave him in my care. And I took him to Frisco, Tommy, to Frisco. And I put him in charge of the best doctors there and paid his board myself. There was nothing he didn't have as he wanted. Don't look that way, my dear boy. For God's sake, don't. Oh, Bill, said Islington, rising and staggering to the window. Why did you keep this from me? Why, said Bill, turning on him savagely. Why? Because I weren't a fool. Thar was you, winning your way in college. There was you, rising in the world. And of some account to it. Here was an old bummer. His good is dead to it. A man has oughter been dead afore. A man has never denied it. But you always liked him better than me, said Bill bitterly. Forgive me, Bill, said the young man, seizing both his hands. I know you did it for the best. But go on. There ain't much more to tell, nor much use to tell it, as I can see, said Bill moodily. He never could be cured, the doctor said, for he had what they called monomania. Was always talking about his wife and daughter that somebody had stole away years ago, and planning revenge on that somebody. And six months ago he was missed. I tracked him to Carson, to Salt Lake City, to Omaha, to Chicago. To New York? And here? Here? echoed Islington. Here? And that's what brings me here today. Whether he's crazy or well, whether he is hunting you or looking up that other man, you must get away from here. You mustn't see him. You and me, Tommy, we will go away on a cruise. In three or four years he'll be dead or missing, and then we'll come back. Come. And he rose to his feet. Bill, 
said Islington, rising also, and taking the hand of his friend, with the same quiet obstinacy that in the old days had endeared him to Bill. Wherever he is, here or elsewhere, sane or crazy, I shall seek and find him. Every dollar that I have shall be his. Every dollar that I have spent shall be returned to him. I am young yet, thank God, and can work. And if there is a way out of this miserable business, I shall find it. I knew, said Bill, with a surliness that ill-concealed his evident admiration of the calm figure before him, I knew the particular style of damn fool that you was, and expected no better. Good-bye, then. God almighty, who's that? He was on his way to open the French window, but had started back, his face quite white and bloodless, and his eyes staring. Islington ran to the window and looked out. A white skirt vanished around the corner of the veranda. When he returned, Bill had dropped into a chair. It must have been Miss Masterman, I think. But what's the matter? Nothing, said Bill faintly. Have you got any whiskey handy? Islington brought a decanter, and, pouring out some spirits, handed the glass to Bill. Bill drained it, and then said, Who is Miss Masterman? Mr. Masterman's daughter. That is, an adopted daughter, I believe. What name? I really don't know, said Islington, pettishly, more vexed than he cared to own at this questioning. Yuba Bill rose and walked to the window, closed it, walked back again to the door, glanced at Islington, hesitated, and then returned to his chair. I didn't tell you I was married, did I? <laughs> he said suddenly, looking up in Islington's face with an unsuccessful attempt at a reckless laugh. No, said Islington, more pained at the manner than the words. Fact, said Yuba Bill. Three years ago it was, Tommy. Three years ago. He looked so hard at Islington that, feeling he was expected to say something, he asked vaguely, Who did you marry? That's it, said Yuba Bill. I can't exactly say. Particularly, though, a she-devil. Generally, the wife of half a dozen other men. Accustomed, apparently, to have his conjugal infelicities a theme of mirth among men, and seeing no trace of amusement on Islington's grave face, his dogged, reckless manner softened, and, drawing his chair closer to Islington, he went on. It all began out of this. We was coming down Watson's grade one night pretty free. When the expressman turns to me and says, There's a row inside. You better pull up. I pulls up, and out hops first a woman, and then two or three chaps swearing and cursing, and trying to drag someone out of them. Then it appeared, Tommy, that it was this woman's drunken husband they was going to put out for abusing her and striking her in the coach. And if it hadn't been for me, my boy, they'd have left that chap there in the road. But I fixes matters up by putting her alongside of me on the box, and we drove on. She was very white, Tommy. For the matter of that, she was always one of those very white women that never got red in the face, but she never cried a whimper. Most women would have cried. It was queer, but she never cried. I thought so at the time. She was very tall with a lot of light hair meandering down the back of her head, as long as a deerskin whiplash, and about the color. She had eyes that bored through you at fifty yards, and pooty hands and feet. And when she kind of got out of that stiff, nervous state she was in, and warmed up a little, and got chipper, by God, sir, she was handsome. She was that. A little flushed and embarrassed at his own enthusiasm, he stopped, and then said, carelessly, They got off at Murphy's. Well, said Islington. Well, I used to see her often after that, and when she was alone she always took the box seat. She kind of confided her troubles to me. How her husband got drunk and abused her, and I didn't see much of him, for he was way in Frisco after that. But it was all square, Tommy, all square twixt me and her. I got to go in there a good deal, and then one day I says to myself, Bill, this won't do. 
and I got changed to another route. Did you ever know Jackson Filtree, Tommy? said Bill, breaking off suddenly. No. Might have heard of him, perhaps? No, said Islington impatiently. Jackson Filtree ran express from White's at the summit, crossed the North Fork of the Yuba. One day he says to me, Bill, that's a mighty bad ford at the North Fork. I says, I believe you, Jackson. It'll get me some day, Bill, sure, says he. I says, why don't you take the lower ford? I don't know, says he, but I can't. So ever after, when I met him, he says, that North Fork ain't got me yet. One day I was in Sacramento, and up comes Filtry. He says, I've sold out that express business on account of the North Fork. But it's bound to get me yet, Bill, sure. And he laughs. Two weeks after, they finds his body below the ford, where he tried to cross, coming down from the summit way. Folks said it was foolishness, Tommy. I says it was fate. The second day after, I was changed to the Placerville route. That woman comes out of the hotel above the stage office. Her husband, she said, was lying sick in Placerville. That's what she said. But it was fate, Tommy. Fate. Three months afterward, her husband takes an overdose of morphine for delirium trends and dies. There's folks says she gave it to him. But it's fate. A year after that, I married her. Fate, Tommy. Fate. I lived with her just three months, he went on, after a long breath. Three months. It ain't much time for a happy man. I seen a good deal of hard life in my day, but there was days in that three months longer than any day in my life. Days, Tommy, when it was a toss-up whether I should kill her or she me. But there, I'm done. You are a young man, Tommy, and I ain't going to tell you things that, old as I am, three years ago I couldn't have believed. When at last, with his grim face turned toward the window, he sat silently with his clinched hands on his knees before him, Islington asked where his wife was now. Ask me no more, my boy, no more. I've had my say. With a gesture as of throwing down a pair of reins before him, he rose and walked to the window. You can understand, Tommy, why a little trip round the world to do me good. If you can't go with me, well and good, but go I must. Not before luncheon, I hope, said a very sweet voice, as Blanche Masterman suddenly stood before them. Father would never forgive me if in his absence I permitted one of Mr. Islington's friends to go in this way. You will stay, won't you? Do. And you will give me your arm now, and when Mr. Islington has done staring, he will follow us into the dining-room and introduce you. I have quite fallen in love with your friend, said Miss Blanche, as they stood in the drawing-room, looking at the figure of Bill, strolling with his short pipe in his mouth through the distant shrubbery. He asks very queer questions, though. He wanted to know my mother's maiden name. He is an honest fellow, said Islington gravely. You are very much subdued. You don't thank me, I dare say, for keeping you and your friend here. But you couldn't go, you know, until father returned. Islington smiled, but not very gaily. And then I think it is much better for us to part here, under these frescoes, don't you? Goodbye. She extended her long, slim hand. Out in the sunlight there, when my eyes were red, you were very anxious to look at me she added in a dangerous voice. Islington raised his sad eyes to hers. Something glittering upon her own sweet lashes trembled and fell. Blanche! She was rosy enough now, and would have withdrawn her hand, but Islington detained it. She was not quite certain but that her waist was also in jeopardy. Yet she could not help saying, are you sure that there isn't anything in the way of a young woman that would keep you? Blanche, said Islington, in reproachful horror, if gentlemen will roar out their secrets before an open window with the young woman lying on the sofa on the veranda, reading a stupid French novel, they must not be surprised if she gives more attention to them than her book. Then you know all, Blanche? I know, 
said Blanche. Let's see. I know the particular style of <clears throat> fool you was, and expected no better. Goodbye. And, gliding like a lovely and innocent milk snake out of his grasp, she slipped away. To the pleasant ripple of waves, the sound of music and light voices, the yellow midsummer moon again rose over Greyport. It looked upon formless masses of rock and shrubbery, wide spaces of lawn and beach, and a shimmering expanse of water. It singled out particular objects, a white sail inshore, a crystal globe upon the lawn, and flashed upon something held between the teeth of a crouching figure scaling the low wall of Cliffwood Lodge. Then, as a man and woman passed out from under the shadows of the foliage into the open moonlight of the garden path, the figure leaped from the wall and stood erect and waiting in the shadow. It was the figure of an old man with rolling eyes, his trembling hand grasping a long, keen knife. A figure more pitiable than pitiless, more pathetic than terrible. But the next moment the knife was stricken from his hand, and he struggled in the firm grasp of another figure that apparently sprang from the wall beside him. "'Damn, Masterman!' cried the old man hoarsely. "'Give me fair play, and I'll kill you yet!' "'Which my name is Yuba Bill,' said Bill quietly. "'And it's time this damn foolin' was stopped!' The old man glared in Bill's face savagely. "'I know you. You're one of Masterman's friends, damn you! Let me go till I cut his heart out! Let me go! Where is my Mary? Where is my wife?' There she is! There! 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 Mary! He would have screamed, but Bill placed his powerful hand upon his mouth as he turned in the direction of the old man's glance. Distinct in the moonlight, the figures of Islington and Blanche, arm in arm, stood out upon the garden path. Give me my wife! muttered the old man hoarsely, between Bill's fingers. Where is she? A sudden fury passed over Yuba Bill's face. "'Where's your wife?' he echoed, pressing the old man back against the garden wall and holding him there as in a vice. "'Where is your wife?' he repeated, thrusting his grim, sardonic jaw and savage eyes into the old man's frightened face. "'Where is Jack Adams' wife? Where's my wife? Where is that she-devil that drove one man mad, that sent another to hell by his own hand, and eternally broke and ruined me? Where? Where?' Do you ask where? In jail, in Sacramento. In jail, do you hear? In jail for murder, Johnson, murder. The old man gasped, stiffened, and then, relaxing, suddenly slipped a mere inanimate mass at Yuba Bill's feet. With a sudden revulsion of feeling, Yuba Bill dropped at his side, and lifting him tenderly in his arms, whispered, Look up, old man, Johnson, look up, for God's sake. It's me, Yuba Bill, and yonder is your daughter, and Tommy. Don't you know Tommy? Little Tommy Islington. Johnson's eyes slowly opened. He whispered, Tommy. Yes, Tommy. Sit by me, Tommy. But don't sit so near the bank. Don't you see how the river is rising and beckoning to me, hissing and boiling over the rocks? It's getting higher. Hold me, Tommy, hold me. And don't let me go yet. We'll live to cut his heart out, Tommy. We'll live, we'll... His head sank, and the rushing river, invisible to all eyes save his, leaped toward him out of the darkness and bore him away, no longer to the darkness, but through it to the distant, peaceful, shining sea. End of chapter 1「How Santa Claus Came to Simpson's Bar » It had been raining in the valley of the Sacramento. The North Fork had overflowed its banks and Rattlesnake Creek was impassable, 
The few boulders that had marked the summer ford at Simpson's Crossing were obliterated by a vast sheet of water stretching to the foothills. The upstage was stopped at Granger's. The last mail had been abandoned in the tools, the rider swimming for his life. An area, remarked the Sierra Avalanche, with pensive local pride, as large as the state of Massachusetts is now under water. Nor was the weather any better in the foothills. The mud lay deep on the mountain road. Wagons that neither physical force nor moral objurgation could move from the evil ways into which they had fallen encumbered the track, and the way to Simpson's Bar was indicated by broken-down teams and hard swearing and farther on, cut off and inaccessible, rained upon and bedraggled, smitten by high winds and threatened by high water, Simpson's Bar, on the eve of Christmas Day, 1862, clung like a swallow's nest to the rocky entablature and splintered capitals of Table Mountain, and shook in the blast. As night shut down on the settlement, a few lights gleamed through the mist from the windows of cabins on either side of the highway, now crossed and gullied by lawless streams and swept by marauding winds. Happily, most of the population were gathered at Thompson's store, clustered round a red-hot stove at which they silently spat in some accepted sense of social communion that perhaps rendered conversation unnecessary. Indeed, most methods of diversion had long since been exhausted on Simpson's Bar. High water had suspended the regular occupations on Gulch and on River, and a consequent lack of money and whiskey had taken the zest from most illegitimate recreation. Even Mr. Hamlin was fain to leave the bar with fifty dollars in his pocket the only amount actually realized of the large sums won by him in the successful exercise of his arduous profession. If I was asked, he remarked somewhat later, if I was asked to point out a pretty little village where a retired sport, as didn't care for money, could exercise itself frequently and lively, I'd say Simpson's Bar. But for a young man with a large family dependent on his exertions, it don't pay. As Mr. Hamlin's family consisted mainly of female adults, this remark is quoted rather to show the breadth of his humor than the exact extent of his responsibilities. Howbeit, the unconscious objects of this satire sat that evening in the listless apathy begotten of idleness and lack of excitement. Even the sudden splashing of hoofs before the door did not arouse them. Dick Bullen alone paused in the act of scraping out his pipe, and lifted his head, but no other one of the group indicated any interest in, or recognition of, the man who entered. It was a figure familiar enough to the company, and known in Simpson's Bar as the Old Man, a man of perhaps fifty years, grizzled and scant of hair, but still fresh and youthful of complexion, a face full of ready but not very powerful sympathy, with a chameleon-like aptitude for taking on the shade and color of contiguous moods and feelings. He had evidently just left some hilarious companions, and did not at first notice the gravity of the group but clapped the shoulder of the nearest man jocularly, and threw himself into a vacant chair. "'Just heard the best thing out, boys. You know Smiley over there? Jim Smiley, funniest man in the bar. Well, Jim was just telling a richest yarn about— "'Smiley's a fool,' interrupted a gloomy voice. "'A particular skunk,' added another in sepulchral accents. A silence followed these positive statements. The old man glanced quickly around the group. Then his face slowly changed. That's so, he said reflectively after a pause. Certainly a sort of a skunk and something of a fool, in course. 
He was silent for a moment as in painful contemplation of the unsavoriness and folly of the unpopular Smiley. "'Dismal weather, ain't it?' he added, now fully embarked on the current of prevailing sentiment. "'Mighty rough papers on the boys, and no show for money this season. And tomorrow's Christmas.' There was a movement among the men at this announcement, but whether of satisfaction or disgust was not plain. Yes, continued the old man, in the lugubrious tone he had, within the last few moments, unconsciously adopted. Yes, Christmas, and tonight's Christmas Eve. You see, boys, I kind of thought, <laughs> that is, I sort of had an idea, just, just passing like, you know, that maybe you'd all like to come over to my house tonight, have a sort of tear round. But I suppose now you wouldn't. Don't feel like it, maybe? He added with anxious sympathy, peering into the faces of his companions. Well, I don't know, responded Tom Flynn with some cheerfulness. Perhaps we may. But how about your wife, old man? What does she say to it? The old man hesitated. His conjugal experience had not been a happy one. And the fact was known to Simpson's Bar. His first wife, a delicate, pretty little woman, had suffered keenly and secretly from the jealous suspicions of her husband, until one day he invited the whole bar to his house to expose her infidelity. On arriving, the party found the shy petite creature quietly engaged in her household duties, and retired abashed and discomfited. But the sensitive woman did not easily recover from the shock of this extraordinary outrage. It was with difficulty she regained her equanimity sufficiently to release her lover from the closet in which he was concealed and escape with him. She left a boy of three years to comfort her bereaved husband. The old man's present wife had been his cook. She was large, loyal, and aggressive. Before he could reply, Joe Dimmick suggested with great directness that it was the old man's house, and that, invoking the divine power, if the case were his own, he would invite whom he pleased, even if in so doing he imperiled his salvation. The powers of evil, he further remarked, should contend against him vainly, all this delivered with a terseness and vigor lost in this necessary translation. Of course, certainly, that's it said the old man with a sympathetic frown. There's no trouble about that. It's my own house. Built every stick on it myself. Don't you be afeard of her, boys. She may cut up a trifle rough, as women do, but she'll come round. Secretly, the old man trusted to the exultation of liquor and the power of courageous example to sustain him in such an emergency. As yet, Dick Bullen, the oracle and leader of Simpson's Bar, had not spoken. He now took his pipe from his lips. Old man, how's that ere Johnny getting on? Seems to me he didn't look so pert last time I seen him on the bluff heaving rocks at Chinaman. Didn't seem to take much interest in it. There was a gang of em by there yesterday, drowned out up the river. And I kind of thought of Johnny, and how he'd miss him. Maybe now we'd be in the way if he was sick. The father, evidently touched not only by this pathetic picture of Tommy's deprivation, but by the considerate delicacy of the speaker, hastened to assure him that Johnny was better, and that a little fun might liven him up. Whereupon Dick arose, shook himself, and sang, I'm ready. Lead the way, old man. Here goes himself led the way with a leap, a characteristic howl, and darted out into the night. As he passed through the outer room, he caught up a blazing brand from the hearth. The action was repeated by the rest of the party, closely following and elbowing each other, and before the astonished proprietor of Thompson's Grocery was aware of the intention of his guests, the room was deserted. The night was pitchy dark. In the first gust of wind their temporary torches were extinguished, 
and only the red brands dancing and flitting in the gloom like drunken will-o'-the-wisps indicated their whereabouts. Their way led up Pine Tree Canyon, at the head of which a broad, low, bark-thatched cabin burrowed in the mountainside. It was the home of the old man, and the entrance to the tunnel in which he worked, when he worked at all. Here the crowd paused for a moment, out of delicate deference to their host, who came up panting in the rear. "'Perhaps you better hold on a second out here, while I go in and see the things is all right,' said the old man, with an indifference he was far from feeling. The suggestion was graciously accepted. The door opened and closed on the host, and the crowd, leaning their backs against the wall and cowering under the eaves, waited and listened. For a few moments there was no sound but the dripping of water from the eaves, and the stir and rustle of wrestling boughs above them. Then the men became uneasy, and whispered suggestion and suspicion passed from the one to the other. Reckon she's caved in his head the first lick. Decoyed him into the tunnel and barred him up, likely. Got him down and sitting on him. Probably bowling something to heave on us. Stand clear of the door, boys. For just then the latch clicked and the door slowly opened, and a voice said, Come in, out of the wet. The voice was neither that of the old man nor of his wife. It was the voice of a small boy, its weak treble broken by that preternatural hoarseness which only vagabondage and the habit of premature self-assertion can give. It was the face of a small boy that looked up at theirs, a face that might have been pretty and even refined, but that it was darkened by evil knowledge from within and dirt and hard experience from without. He had a blanket around his shoulders and had evidently just risen from his bed. Come in, he repeated, and don't make no noise. The old man's in there talking to Ma, he continued, pointing to an adjacent room which seemed to be a kitchen from which the old man's voice came in deprecating accents. Let me be, he added querulously, to Dick Bullen, who had caught him up, blanket and all, and was affecting to toss him into the fire. Let go of me, you damned old fool, do you hear? Thus adjured, Dick Bullen lowered Johnny to the ground with a smothered laugh, while the men, entering quietly, ranged themselves around a long table of rough boards which occupied the center of the room. Johnny then gravely proceeded to a cupboard and brought out several articles which he deposited on the table. That's whiskey, and crackers, and red herons, and cheese. He took a bite of the latter on his way to the table. And sugar. He scooped up a mouthful and root with a small and very dirty hand. And tobacco. There's dried apples, too, on the shelf, but I don't admire em. Apples is swelling. Dar, he concluded. Now, wade in, and don't be afeard. I don't mind the old woman. She don't belong to me. So long. He had stepped to the threshold of a small room, scarcely larger than a closet, partitioned off from the main apartment, and holding in its dim recess a small bed. He stood there a moment looking at the company, his bare feet peeping from the blanket, and nodded. "'Hello, Johnny. You ain't going to turn in again, are you?' said Dick. "'Yes, I are,' responded Johnny decidedly. "'Why, what's up, old fellow?' "'I'm sick.' "'How sick?' "'I've got fever, and childblains, and rheumatism,' returned Johnny, and vanished within. After a moment's pause, he added, in the dark, apparently from under the bedclothes, "'And Biles!' There was an embarrassing silence. The men looked at each other and at the fire. Even with the appetizing banquet before them, 
It seemed as if they might again fall into the despondency of Thompson's grocery, when the voice of the old man, incautiously lifted, came deprecatingly from the kitchen. Certainly, that's so. In course they is. A gang of lazy drunk loafers, and not their dick bones the orneriest of all. Didn't have no more sabby than to come round there with sickness in the house and no provision. That's what I said. Bullin', says I, it's crazy drunk you are, or a fool, says I, to think of such a thing. Staples, I says, be you a man, Staples, and expect to race hell under my roof with invalids laying round? But they would come, they would. That's why you must speck to such trash as lays round the bar. A burst of laughter from the men followed this unfortunate exposure. Whether it was overheard in the kitchen, or whether the old man's irate companion had just exhausted all other modes of expressing her contemptuous indignation, I cannot say. But a back door was suddenly slammed with great violence. A moment later the old man reappeared, happily unconscious of the cause of the late hilarious outburst, and smiled blandly. The old woman thought she'd just run over to Miss McFadden's for a sociable call, he explained, with jaunty indifference, as he took a seat at the board. Oddly enough, it needed this untoward incident to relieve the embarrassment that was beginning to be felt by the party, and their natural audacity returned with their host. I do not propose to record the convivialities of that evening. The inquisitive reader will accept the statement that the conversation was characterized by the same intellectual exultation, the same cautious reverence, the same fastidious delicacy, the same rhetorical precision, and the same logical and coherent discourse somewhat later in the evening which distinguishes similar gatherings of the masculine sex in more civilized localities and under more favorable auspices. No glasses were broken in the absence of any. No liquor was uselessly spilt on the floor or table in the scarcity of that article. It was nearly midnight when the festivities were interrupted. Hush, said Dick Bullen, holding up his hand. It was the querulous voice of Johnny from his adjacent closet. Oh, Dad! The old man rose hurriedly and disappeared in the closet. Presently he reappeared. His rheumatiz is coming on again bad, he explained, and he wants rubbing. He lifted the demijohn of whiskey from the table and shook it. It was empty. Dick Bullen put down his tin cup with an embarrassed laugh. So did the others. The old man examined their contents and said hopefully, I reckon that's enough. He don't need much. You hold on all year for a spell, and I'll be back. And vanished in the closet with an old flannel shirt and the whiskey. The door closed but imperfectly, and the following dialogue was distinctly audible. Now, Sonny, where does she hurt worst? Sometimes over there, and sometimes under here. But it's most powerful from here to here. Rub your ear, Dad. A silence seemed to indicate a brisk rubbing. Then Johnny. Having a good time out here, Dad? Yes, honey. Tomorrow's Christmas, ain't it? Yes, honey. How does she feel now? Better rub a little further down. What's Christmas, anyway? What's it all about? Oh, it's a day. This exhaustive definition was apparently satisfactory, for there was a silent interval of rubbing. Presently, Johnny again. Ma says that everywhere else but here, everybody gives things to everybody Christmas. Then she just waded into you. She says there's a man they call Sandy Claus. Not a white man, you know, but a, a kind of Chinaman comes down the chimney night afore Christmas and gives things to children, boys like me, puts them in their buttes. That's what she tried to play upon me. Easy now, Pop. Where are you rubbing to? That's a mile from the place. She just made that up, didn't she? Just to aggravate me and you. Don't rub there. Why, Dad? In the great quiet that seemed to have fallen upon the house, 
The sigh of the near pines and the drip of leaves without was very distinct. Johnny's voice, too, was lowered as he went on. Don't you take on now, for I'm getting all right fast. What's the boys doing out there? The old man partly opened the door and peered through. His guests were sitting there sociably enough, and there were a few silver coins and a lean buckskin purse on the table. Betting on something. Some little game or another. They're all right, he replied to Johnny and recommenced his rubbing. I'd like to take a hand and win some money, said Johnny, reflectively, after a pause. The old man glibly repeated what was evidently a familiar formula, that if Johnny would wait until he struck it rich in the tunnel, he'd have lots of money, etc., etc. Yes, said Johnny, but you don't. And whether you strike it or I win it, it's about the same. It's all luck. But it's mighty curious about Christmas, ain't it? Why do they call it Christmas? Perhaps from some instinctive deference to the overbearing of his guests, or from some vague sense of incongruity, the old man's reply was so low as to be inaudible beyond the room. Yes, said Johnny, with some slight abatement of interest. I've heard of him before. There, that'll do, Dad. I don't ache near so bad as I did. Now, let me tighten this here blanket. So. Now, he added in a muffled whisper, sit down here by me till I go to sleep. To assure himself of obedience, he disengaged one hand from the blanket and, grasping his father's sleeve, again composed himself to rest. For some moments the old man waited patiently. Then the unwanted stillness of the house excited his curiosity, and without moving from the bed, he cautiously opened the door with his disengaged hand and looked into the main room. In his infinite surprise, it was dark and deserted. But even then, a smoldering log on the hearth broke, and by the upspringing blaze, he saw the figure of Dick Bullen sitting by the dying embers. Hello! Dick started, rose, and came somewhat unsteadily toward him. "'Where's the boys?' asked the old man. "'Gone up the canyon on a little pacer. "'They're coming back for me in a minute. "'I'm waiting round for them. "'What are you staring at, old man?' <laughs> he added with a forced laugh. "'Do you think I'm drunk?' "'The old man might have been pardoned the supposition.' for Dick's eyes were humid and his face flushed. He loitered and lounged back to the chimney, yawned, shook himself, buttoned up his coat, and laughed. <laughs> Liquor ain't so plenty as that, old man. Now, don't you get up, he continued, as the old man made a movement to release his sleeve from Johnny's hand. Don't you mind matters. Sit just where you be. I'm going in a jiffy. There. That's them now. There was a low tap at the door. Dick Bullen opened it quickly, nodded good night to his host, and disappeared. The old man would have followed him but for the hand that still unconsciously grasped his sleeve. He could have easily disengaged it. It was small, weak, and emaciated. But perhaps because it was small, weak, and emaciated, he changed his mind and, drawing his chair closer to the bed, rested his head upon it. In this defenseless attitude, the potency of his earlier potations surprised him. The room flickered and faded before his eyes, reappeared, faded again, went out, and left him asleep. Meantime, Dick Bullen, closing the door, confronted his companions. "'Are you ready?' said Staples. Ready, said Dick. What's the time? Past twelve, was the reply. Can you make it? It's nigh on fifty miles, the round trip hither and yon. I reckon, returned Dick shortly. Where's the mare? Bill and Jack's holding her at the crossing. Let him hold on a minute longer, said Dick. 
He turned and re-entered the house softly. By the light of the guttering candle and dying fire he saw that the door of the little room was open. He stepped toward it on tiptoe and looked in. The old man had fallen back in his chair, snoring, his helpless feet thrust out in a line with his collapsed shoulders, and his hat pulled over his eyes. Beside him, on the narrow wooden bedstead, lay Johnny, muffled tightly in a blanket that hid all save a strip of forehead and a few curls damp with perspiration. Dick Bullen made a step forward, hesitated, and glanced over his shoulder into the deserted room. Everything was quiet. With a sudden resolution, he parted his huge mustaches with both hands and stooped over the sleeping boy. But even as he did so, a mischievous blast, lying in wait, swooped down the chimney, rekindled the hearth, and lit up the room with a shameless glow from which Dick fled in bashful terror. His companions were already waiting for him at the crossing. Two of them were struggling in the darkness with some strange misshapen bulk, which as Dick came nearer took the semblance of a great yellow horse. It was the mare. She was not a pretty picture. From her Roman nose to her riding haunches, from her arched spine hidden by the stiff machilas of a Mexican saddle, to her thick, straight, bony legs, there was not a line of equine grace. In her half-blind but wholly vicious white eyes, in her protruding underlip, in her monstrous color, there was nothing but ugliness and vice. "'Now then,' said Staples, "'start clear of her heels, boys, and up with you. Don't miss your first holt of her mane, and mind you, get your off stirrup quick. Ready?' There was a leap, a scrambling struggle, a bound, a wild retreat of the crowd, a circle of flying hoofs, two springless leaps that jarred the earth, a rapid play and jingle of spurs, a plunge, and then the voice of Dick somewhere in the darkness. All right. Don't take the lower road back unless you're hard pushed for time. Don't hold her in the downhill. We'll be at the ford at five. Galang, Hoopa, Mula, go! A splash, a spark struck from the ledge in the road, a clatter in the rocky cut beyond, and Dick was gone. Sing, O Muse, the ride of Richard Bullen. Sing, O Muse, of chivalrous men, the sacred quest, the doughty deeds, the battery of low churls, the fearsome ride and gruesome perils of the flower of Simpson's Bar. Alack, she is dainty, this muse. She will have none of this bucking brute and swaggering ragged rider and I must fain follow him in prose afoot. It was one o'clock, and yet he had only gained Rattlesnake Hill. For in that time Jovita had rehearsed to him all her imperfections and practiced all her vices. Thrice she had stumbled. Twice she had thrown up her Roman nose in a straight line with the reins and, resisting bit and spur, struck out madly across country. Twice had she reared, and rearing, fallen backward, and twice had the agile Dick, unharmed, regained his seat before she found her vicious legs again. And a mile beyond them, at the foot of a long hill, was Rattlesnake Creek. Dick knew that here was the crucial test of his ability to perform his enterprise, set his teeth grimly, put his knees well into her flanks, and changed his defensive tactics to brisk aggression. Bullied and maddened, Jovita began the descent of the hill. Here the artful Richard pretended to hold her in with ostentatious objurgation and well-feigned cries of alarm. It is unnecessary to add that Jovita instantly ran away nor need I state the time made in the descent. It is written in the Chronicles of Simpson's Bar. 
enough that in another moment, as it seemed to Dick, she was splashing on the overflowed banks of Rattlesnake Creek. As Dick expected, the momentum she had acquired carried her beyond the point of balking, and, holding her well together for a mighty leap, they dashed into the middle of the swiftly flowing current. A few moments of kicking, wading, and swimming, and Dick drew a long breath on the opposite bank. The road from Rattlesnake Creek to Red Mountain was tolerably level. Either the plunge in Rattlesnake Creek had dampened her baleful fire, or the art which led to it had shown her the superior wickedness of her rider, for Jovita no longer wasted her surplus energy in wanton conceits. Once she bucked, but it was from force of habit. Once she shied, but it was from a new freshly painted meeting house at the crossing of the county road. Hollows, ditches, gravelly deposits, patches of freshly springing grasses flew from beneath her rattling hoofs. She began to smell unpleasantly. Once or twice she coughed slightly but there was no abatement of her strength or speed. By two o'clock he had passed Red Mountain and begun the descent to the plain. Ten minutes later the driver of the fast pioneer coach was overtaken and passed by a man on a pinto hoss, an event sufficiently notable for remark. At half-past two Dick rose in his stirrups with a great shout. Stars were glittering through the rifted clouds, and beyond him, out of the plain, rose two spires, a flagstaff, and a straggling line of black objects. Dick jingled his spurs and swung his riata. Jovita bounded forward, and in another moment they swept into Tuttleville and drew up before the wooden piazza of the Hotel of All Nations. What transpired that night at Tuttleville? is not strictly a part of this record. Briefly I may state, however, that after Jovita had been handed over to a sleepy ostler, whom she at once kicked into unpleasant consciousness, Dick sallied out with the barkeeper for a tour of the sleeping town. Lights still gleamed from a few saloons and gambling houses, but avoiding these they stopped before several closed shops and, by persistent tapping and judicious outcry, roused the proprietors from their beds and made them unbar the doors of their magazines and expose their wares. Sometimes they were met by curses, but oftener by interest and some concern in their needs, and the interview was invariably concluded by a drink. It was three o'clock before this pleasantry was given over, and, with a small waterproof bag of India rubber strapped on his shoulders, Dick returned to the hotel. But here he was waylaid by beauty. Beauty opulent in charms, affluent in dress, persuasive in speech, and Spanish in accent. In vain she repeated the invitation in Excelsior. Happily scorned by all alpine-climbing youth, and rejected by this child of the Sierras, a rejection softened in this instance by a laugh and his last gold coin. And then he sprang to the saddle and dashed down the lonely street and out into the lonelier plain, where presently the lights, the black line of houses, the spires, and the flagstaff sank into the earth behind him again and were lost in the distance. The storm had cleared away, the air was brisk and cold, the outlines of adjacent landmarks were distinct, but it was half-past four before Dick reached the meeting-house and the crossing of the county road. To avoid the rising grade he had taken a longer and more circuitous road, in whose viscid mud Jovita sank fetlock deep at every bound. It was a poor preparation for a steady ascent of five miles more, but Jovita, gathering her legs under her, took it with her usual blind, unreasoning fury, and a half-hour later reached the long level that led to Rattlesnake Creek. Another half-hour would bring him to the creek. He threw the reins lightly upon the neck of the mare, chirruped to her, and began to sing. 
Suddenly Jovita shied with a bound that would have unseated a less practiced rider. Hanging to her rein was a figure that had leaped from the bank, and at the same time from the road before her arose a shadowy horse and rider. "'Throw up your hands!' commanded this second apparition with an oath. Dick felt the mare tremble, quiver, and apparently sink under him. He knew what it meant and was prepared. "'Stand aside, Jack Simpson. I know you, damned thief. Let me pass, or—' He did not finish the sentence. Jovita rose straight in the air with a terrific bound, throwing the figure from her bit with a single shake of her vicious head, and charged with deadly malevolence down on the impediment before her. An oath, a pistol shot, horse and highwayman rolled over in the road, and the next moment Jovita was a hundred yards away. But the good right arm of her rider, shattered by a bullet, dropped helplessly at his side. Without slacking his speed he shifted the reins to his left hand but a few moments later he was obliged to halt and tighten the saddle girths that had slipped in the onset. This, in his crippled condition, took some time. He had no fear of pursuit, but looking up he saw that the eastern stars were already paling, and that the distant peaks had lost their ghostly whiteness, and now stood out blackly against a lighter sky. Day was upon him. Then, completely absorbed in a single idea, he forgot the pain of his wound, and mounting again, dashed on toward Rattlesnake Creek. But now Jovita's breath came broken by gasps. Dick reeled in his saddle, and brighter and brighter grew the sky. Ride, Richard! Run, Jovita! Linger, O oh day! For the last few rods there was a roaring in his ears. Was it exhaustion from loss of blood, or what? He was dazed and giddy as he swept down the hill, and did not recognize his surroundings. Had he taken the wrong road? Or was this Rattlesnake Creek? It was, but the brawling creek he had swam a few hours before had risen, more than doubled its volume, and now rolled a swift and resistless river between him and Rattlesnake Hill. For the first time that night, Richard's heart sank within him. The river, the mountain, the quickening east, swam before his eyes. He shut them to recover his self-control. In that brief interval, by some fantastic mental process, the little room at Simpson's bar and the figures of the sleeping father and son rose upon him. He opened his eyes wildly, cast off his coat, pistol, boots, and saddle, bound the precious pack tightly to his shoulders, grasped the bare flanks of Jovita with his bared knees, and with a shout dashed into the yellow water. A cry rose from the opposite bank as the head of a man and horse struggled for a few moments against the battling current, and then were swept away amidst uprooted trees and whirling driftwood. The old man started and woke. The fire on the hearth was dead, the candle in the outer room flickering in its socket, and somebody was rapping at the door. He opened it, but fell back with a cry before the dripping, half-naked figure that reeled against the doorpost. Dick? Hush. Is he awake yet? No, but Dick? Dry up, you old fool. Get me some whiskey quick. The old man flew and returned with an empty bottle. Dick would have sworn, but his strength was not equal to the occasion. He staggered, caught at the handle of the door, and motioned to the old man. There's something in my pack here for Johnny. Take it off, I can't. The old man unstrapped the pack and laid it before the exhausted man. Open it, quick. He did so with trembling fingers. It contained only a few poor toys, cheap and barbaric enough, goodness knows, but bright with paint and tinsel. One of them was broken. Another, I fear, was irretrievably ruined by water. And on a third, ah me, 
there was a cruel spot. It don't look like much, that's a fact, said Dick ruefully. But it's the best we could do. Take him, old man, and put him in his stocking. And tell him, tell him, you know, hold me, old man. The old man caught at his sinking figure. Tell him, said Dick, with a weak little laugh, <laughs> tell him Sandy Claus has come. And even so, bedraggled, ragged, unshaven and unshorn, with one arm hanging helplessly at his side, Santa Claus came to Simpson's bar and fell fainting on the first threshold. The Christmas dawn came slowly after, touching the remoter peaks with the rosy warmth of ineffable love, and it looked so tenderly on Simpson's bar that the whole mountain, as if caught in a generous action, blushed to the skies. End of chapter 2「Three of Mrs. Skagg's Husbands and Other Stories by Bret Hart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Princess Bob and Her Friends She was a Klamath Indian. Her title was, I think, a compromise between her claim as daughter of chief and gratitude to her earliest white protector, whose name after the Indian fashion she had adopted. Bob Walker had taken her from the breast of her dead mother at a time when the sincere volunteer soldiery of the California frontier were impressed with the belief that extermination was the manifest destiny of the Indian race. He had with difficulty restrained the noble zeal of his compatriots long enough to convince them that the exemption of one Indian baby would not invalidate this theory, and he took her to his home a pastoral clearing on the banks of the Salmon River, where she was cared for after a frontier fashion. Before she was nine years old, she had exhausted the scant kindliness of the thin, overworked Mrs. Walker. As a playfellow of the young Walkers, she was unreliable. As a nurse for the baby, she was inefficient. She lost the former in the trackless depths of a redwood forest, she basely abandoned the latter in an extemporized cradle, hanging like a chrysalis to a convenient bough. She lied and she stole. Two unpardonable sins in a frontier community where truth was a necessity and provisions were the only property. Worse than this, the outskirts of the clearing were sometimes haunted by blanketed tattermalions, with whom she had mysterious confidences. Mr. Walker more than once regretted his indiscreet humanity, but she presently relieved him of responsibility, and possibly of blood guiltiness, by disappearing entirely. When she reappeared, it was at the adjacent village of Logport, in the capacity of housemaid to a trader's wife, who, joining some little culture to considerable conscientiousness, attempted to instruct her charge but the princess proved an unsatisfactory pupil to even so liberal a teacher she accepted the alphabet with great good humor but always as a pleasing and recurring novelty in which all interest expired at the completion of each lesson she found a thousand uses for her books and writing materials other than those known to civilized children she made a curious necklace of bits of slate pencil she constructed a miniature canoe from the pasteboard covers of her primer. She bent her pens into fishhooks, and tattooed the faces of her younger companions with blue ink. Religious instruction she received as good-humoredly, and learned to pronounce the name of the deity with a cheerful familiarity that shocked her preceptress. Nor could her reverence be reached through analogy. She knew nothing of the great spirit, and professed entire ignorance of the happy hunting grounds. Yet she attended divine service regularly, and as regularly asked for a hymn book. 
and it was only through the discovery that she had collected twenty-five of these volumes and had hidden them behind the woodpile that her connection with the First Baptist Church of Logport ceased. She would occasionally abandon these civilized and Christian privileges and disappear from her home, returning after several days of absence with an odor of bark and fish, and a peace offering to her mistress in the shape of venison or game. To add to her troubles, she was now fourteen, and according to the laws of her race, a woman. I do not think the most romantic fancy would have called her pretty. Her complexion defied most of those ambiguous similes through which poets unconsciously apologize for any deviation from the Caucasian standard. It was not wine nor amber-colored. If anything, it was smoky. Her face was tattooed with red and white lines on one cheek as if a duo-toothed comb had been drawn from cheekbone to jaw, and, but for the good humor that beamed from her small, berry-like eyes and shone in her white teeth, she would have been repulsive. She was short and stout. In her scant drapery and unrestrained freedom she was hardly statuesque, and her more studied attitudes were marred by a simian habit of softly scratching her left ankle with the toes of her right foot in moments of contemplation. I think I have already shown enough to indicate the incongruity of her existence with even the low standard of civilization that obtained at Logport in the year 1860. It needed but one more fact to prove the far-sighted poetical sagacity and prophetic ethics of those sincere advocates of extermination to whose virtues I have done but scant justice in the beginning of this article. This fact was presently furnished by the princess. After one of her periodical disappearances, this time unusually prolonged, she astonished Logport by returning with a half-breed baby of a week old in her arms. That night a meeting of the hard-featured serious matrons of Logport was held at Mrs. Brown's. The immediate banishment of the princess was demanded. Soft-hearted Mrs. Brown endeavored vainly to get a mitigation or a suspension of the sentence. But, as on a former occasion, the princess took matters into her own hands. A few mornings afterwards, a wicker cradle containing an Indian baby was found hanging on the handle of the door of the First Baptist Church. It was the Parthian arrow of the flying princess. From that day, Logport knew her no more. It had been a bright, clear day on the upland, so clear that the ramparts of Fort Jackson and the flagstaff were plainly visible twelve miles away from the long, curving peninsula that stretched a bared white arm around the peaceful waters of Logport Bay. It had been a clear day upon the seashore, albeit the air was filled with the flying spume and shifting sand of a straggling beach whose low dunes were dragged down by the long surges of the Pacific and thrown up again by the tumultuous trade winds. But the sun had gone down in a bank of fleecy fog that was beginning to roll in upon the beach. Gradually the headland at the entrance of the harbor and the lighthouse disappeared. Then the willow fringe that marked the line of Salmon River vanished, and the ocean was gone. A few sails still gleamed on the waters of the bay, but the advancing fog wiped them out one by one, crept across the steel-blue expanse, swallowed up the white mills and single spire of Logport, and, joining with reinforcements from the marshes, moved solemnly up the hills. Ten minutes more, and the landscape was utterly blotted out. Simultaneously the wind died away, and a death-like silence stole over sea and shore. The faint clang high overhead of unseen Brent, the nearer call of invisible plover, the lap and wash of indistinguishable waters, and the monotonous roll of the vanished ocean were the only sounds. As night deepened, the far-off booming of the fog-bell on the headland, at intervals stirred the thick air. Hard by the shore of the bay, 
and, half hidden by a drifting sand hill, stood a low, nondescript structure, to whose composition sea and shore had equally contributed. It was partly built of logs and partly of driftwood and tarred canvas. Joined to one end of the main building, the ordinary log cabin of the settler, was the half-round pilot house of some wrecked steamer, while the other gable terminated in half of a broken whale-boat. Nailed against the boat were the dried skins of wild animals, and scattered about lay the flotsam and jetsam of many years' gathering. Bamboo crates, casks, hatches, blocks, auras, boxes, parts of a whale's vertebrae, and the blades of swordfish. Drawn up on the beach of a little cove before the house lay a canoe. As the night thickened and the fog grew more dense, these details grew imperceptible, and only the windows of the pilot house, lit up by a roaring fire within the hut, gleamed redly through the mist. By this fire, beneath a ship's lamp that swung from the roof, two figures were seated, a man and a woman. The man, broad-shouldered and heavily bearded, stretched his listless, powerful length beyond a broken bamboo chair, with his eyes fixed on the fire. The woman crouched cross-legged upon the broad earthen hearth, with her eyes blinkingly fixed on her companion. They were small, black, round, berry-like eyes, and as the firelight shone upon her smoky face, with its one striped cheek of gorgeous brilliancy, it was plainly the Princess Bob and no other. Not a word was spoken. They had been sitting thus for more than an hour, and there was about their attitude a suggestion that silence was habitual. Once or twice the man rose and walked up and down the narrow room, or gazed absently through the windows of the pilot house, but never by look or sign betrayed the slightest consciousness of his companion. At such times, the princess, from her nest by the fire, followed him with eyes of canine expectancy and wistfulness. But he would as inevitably return to his contemplation of the fire, and the princess to her blinking watchfulness of his face. They had sat there silent and undisturbed for many an evening in fair weather and foul. They had spent many a day in sunshine and storm, gathering the unclaimed spoil of sea and shore. They had kept these mute relations, varied only by the incidents of the hunt or meagre household duties for three years, ever since the man, wandering moodily over the lonely sands, had fallen upon the half-starved woman lying in the little hollow where she had crawled to die. It had seemed as if they would never be disturbed, until now, when the princess started, and, with the instinct of her race, bent her ear to the ground. The wind had risen, and was rattling the tarred canvas, but in another moment there plainly came from without the hut the sound of voices, then followed a rap at the door, then another rap, and then, before they could rise to their feet, the door was flung briskly open. "'I beg your pardon,' said a pleasant but somewhat decided contralto voice. "'But I don't think you heard me knock. Ah, I see you did not. May I come in?' There was no reply. Had the battered figurehead of the goddess of liberty, which lay deeply embedded in the sand on the beach, suddenly appeared at the door demanding admittance, the occupants of the cabin could not have been more speechlessly and hopelessly astonished than at the form which stood in the open doorway. It was that of a slim, shapely, elegantly dressed young woman. A scarlet-lined silken hood was half thrown back from the shining mass of the black hair that covered her small head. From her pretty shoulders dropped a fur cloak only restrained by a cord and tassel in her small gloved hand. Around her full throat was a double necklace of large white beads, that by some cunning feminine trick relieved with its infantile suggestion the strong decision of her lower face. Did you say yes? Ah, thank you. We may come in, Barker. Here a shadow in a blue army overcoat followed her into the cabin, touched its cap respectfully, 
and then stood silent and erect against the wall. Don't disturb yourself in the least, I beg. What a distressingly unpleasant night. Is this your usual climate? Half graciously, half absently overlooking the still embarrassed silence of the group, she went on. We started from the fort over three hours ago. Three hours ago, wasn't it, Barker? The erect Barker touched his cap. To go to Captain Emmons' quarters on Indian Island. I think you call it Indian Island, don't you? She was appealing to the awe-struck princess. And we got into the fog and lost our way. That is, Barker lost his way. Barker touched his cap deprecatingly. And goodness knows where we didn't wander to until we mistook your light for the lighthouse and pulled up here. No, no, pray keep your seat, do. Really, I must insist. Nothing could exceed the languid grace of the latter part of this speech. Nothing except the easy unconsciousness with which she glided by the offered chair of her stammering, embarrassed host and stood beside the open heart. Barker will tell you, she continued, warming her feet by the fire, that I am Miss Portfire, daughter of Major Portfire, commanding the post. Ah, excuse me, child. She had accidentally trodden upon the bare yellow toes of the princess. Really, I did not know you were there. I am very near-sighted. In confirmation of her statement, she put to her eyes a dainty double eyeglass that dangled from her neck. It's a shocking thing to be near-sighted, isn't it? If the shamefaced, uneasy man to whom this remark was addressed could have found words to utter the thought that even in his confusion struggled uppermost in his mind, he would, looking at the bold dark eyes that questioned him, have denied the fact. But he only stammered, Yes. The next moment, however, Miss Portfire had apparently forgotten him and was examining the princess through her glass. And what is your name, child? The princess, beatified by the eyes and eyeglass, showed all her white teeth at once and softly scratched her leg. Bob? Bob! What a singular name! Miss Portfire's host here hastened to explain the origin of the princess's title. Then you are Bob. Eyeglass. No, my name is Gray. John Gray. And he actually achieved a bow where awkwardness was rather the air of imperfectly recalling a forgotten habit. Gray. Ah, let me see. Yes, certainly. You are Mr. Gray, the recluse, the hermit, the philosopher, and all that sort of thing. Why, certainly. Dr. Jones, our surgeon, has told me all about you. Dear me, how interesting a rencontre. Lived all alone here for seven, was it seven years? Yes, I, I remember now. Existed quite au naturel, one might say. How odd. Not that I know anything about that sort of thing, you know. I've lived always among people, and am really quite a stranger, I assure you. But honestly, Mr. I beg your pardon? Mr. Gray, how do you like it? She had quietly taken his chair and thrown her cloak and hood over its back, and was now thoughtfully removing her gloves. Whatever were the arguments, and they were doubtless many and profound, whatever the experience, and it was doubtless hard and satisfying enough, by which this unfortunate man had justified his life for the last seven years, Somehow they suddenly became trivial and terribly ridiculous before this simple and practical question. Well, you shall tell me all about it after you have given me something to eat. We will have time enough. Barker cannot find his way back in this fog tonight. Now don't put yourselves to any trouble on my account. Barker will assist. Barker came forward. Glad to escape the scrutiny of his guest, the hermit gave a few rapid directions to the princess in her native tongue and disappeared in the shed. Left a moment alone, Miss Portfire took a quick, half-audible feminine inventory of the cabin. Books, guns, skins, one chair, one bed, no pictures, 
and no looking-glass. She took a book from the swinging shelf and resumed her seat by the fire as the princess re-entered with fresh fuel. But while kneeling on the hearth, the princess chanced to look up and met Miss Portfire's dark eyes over the edge of her book. Bob! The princess showed her teeth. Listen, would you like to have fine clothes, rings, and beads like these? To have your hair nicely combed and put up so? Would you? The princess nodded violently. Would you like to live with me and have them? Answer quickly. Don't look around for him. Speak for yourself, would you? Hush, never mind now. The hermit re-entered, and the princess blinking retreated into the shadow of the whaleboat shed, from which she did not emerge, even when the homely repast of cold venison, ship biscuit, and tea was served. Miss Portfire noticed her absence. You really must not let me interfere with your usual simple ways. Do you know this is exceedingly interesting to me, so pastoral and patriarchal and all that sort of thing. I must insist upon the princess coming back. Really, I must. But the princess was not to be found in the shed, and Miss Portfire, who the next minute seemed to have forgotten all about her, took her place in the single chair before an extemporized table. Barker stood behind her, and the hermit leaned against the fireplace. Miss Portfire's appetite did not come up to her protestations. For the first time in seven years it occurred to the hermit that his ordinary victual might be improved. He stammered out something to that effect. "'I have eaten better and worse,' said Miss Portfire quietly. But I thought you, that is, you said? I spent a year in the hospitals when father was on the Potomac, returned Miss Portfire composedly. After a pause, she continued. You remember after the second bull run? But, dear me, I beg your pardon, of course. You know nothing about the war and all that sort of thing, and don't care. She put up her eyeglass and quietly surveyed his broad muscular figure against the chimney. Or perhaps your prejudices... But then, as a hermit, you know you have no politics, of course. Please don't let me bore you. To have been strictly consistent, the hermit should have exhibited no interest in the topic. Perhaps it was owing to some quality in the narrator, but he was constrained to beg her to continue in such phrases as his unfamiliar lips could command so that little by little miss portfire yielded up incident and personal observation of the contest then raging with the same half abstracted half unconcerned air that seemed habitual to her she told the stories of privation of suffering of endurance and of sacrifice with the same assumption of timid deference that concealed her great self-control she talked of principles and rights apparently without enthusiasm and without effort of which his morbid nature would have been suspicious she sang the great american iliad in a way that stirred the depths of her solitary auditor to its massive foundations then she stopped and asked quietly where is bob the hermit started he would look for her but bob for some reason was not forthcoming search was made within and without the hut but in vain for the first time that evening miss portfire showed some anxiety go she said to barker and find her she must be found stay give me your overcoat i'll go myself she threw the overcoat over her shoulders and stepped out into the night in the thick veil of fog that seemed suddenly to enwrap her she stood for a moment irresolute and then walked toward the beach guided by the low wash of waters on the sand she had not taken many steps before she stumbled over some dark crouching object reaching down her hand she felt the coarse wiry mane of the princess bob there was no reply bob i've come looking for you come go away nonsense bob i want you to stay with me tonight. come injun squaw no good for wadgy woman 
Go away. Listen, Bob. You are the daughter of a chief. So am I. Your father had many warriors. So has mine. It is good that you stay with me. Come. The princess chuckled and suffered herself to be lifted up. A few moments later, and they re-entered the hut hand in hand. With the first red streaks of dawn the next day, the erect Barker touched his cap at the door of the hut. Beside him stood the hermit, also just risen from his blanketed nest in the sand. Forth from the hut, fresh as the morning air, stepped Miss Portfire, leading the princess by the hand. Hand in hand also they walked to the shore, and when the princess had been safely bestowed in the stern sheets, Miss Portfire turned and held out her own to her late hosts. "'I shall take the best care of her, of course. You will come and see her often. I should ask you to come and see me, but you are a hermit, you know, and all that sort of thing. But if it's the correct, anchorite thing, and can be done, my father will be glad to requite you for this night's hospitality. But don't do anything on my account that interferes with your simple habits. Good-bye. She handed him a card, which he took mechanically. Good-bye. The sail was hoisted, and the boat shoved off. As the fresh morning breeze caught the white canvas, it seemed to bow a parting salutation. There was a rosy flash of promise on the water, and as the light craft darted forward toward the ascending sun, it seemed for a moment uplifted in its glory. Miss Portfire kept her word. If thoughtful care and intelligent kindness could regenerate the princess, her future was secure. And it really seemed as if she were, for the first time, inclined to heed the lessons of civilization and profit by her new condition. An agreeable change was first noticed in her appearance. Her lawless hair was caught in a net and no longer strayed over her low forehead. Her unstable bust was stayed and upheld by French corsets. Her plantigrade shuffle was limited by heeled boots. Her dresses were neat and clean, and she wore a double necklace of glass beads. With this physical improvement there also seemed some moral awakening. She no longer stole nor lied. With the possession of personal property came a respect for that of others. With increased dependence on the word of those about her came a thoughtful consideration of her own. Intellectually she was still feeble, although she grappled sturdily with the simple lessons which Miss Portfire set before her. But her zeal and simple vanity outran her discretion, and she would often sit for hours with an open book before her, which she could not read. She was a favorite with the officers at the fort, from the major, who shared his daughter's prejudices, and often yielded to her powerful self-will, to the subalterns, who liked her none the less that her natural enemies, the frontier volunteers, had declared war against her helpless sisterhood. The only restraint put upon her was the limitation of her liberty to the enclosure of the fort and parade, and only once did she break this parole and was stopped by the sentry as she stepped into a boat at the landing. The recluse did not avail himself of Miss Portfire's invitation, but after the departure of the princess he spent less of his time in the hut, and was more frequently seen in the distant marshes of Eel River and on the upland hills. A feverish restlessness, quite opposed to his usual phlegm, led him into singular freaks strangely inconsistent with his usual habits and reputation. The pursuer of the occasional steamer which stopped at Logport with the mails reported to have been boarded, just inside the bar, by a strange bearded man who asked for a newspaper containing the last war telegrams. He tore his red shirt into narrow strips and spent two days with his needle over the pieces and the tattered remnant of his only white garment and a few days afterward the fisherman on the bay was surprised to see what, on nearer approach, proved to be a rude imitation of the national flag floating from a spar above the hut. One evening, as the fog began to drift over the sand hills, the recluse sat alone in his hut. 
The fire was dying unheeded on the hearth, for he had been sitting there for a long time, completely absorbed in the blurred pages of an old newspaper. Presently he arose, and, refolding it, an operation of great care and delicacy in its tattered condition, placed it under the blankets of his bed. He resumed his seat by the fire, but soon began drumming with his fingers on the arm of his chair. Eventually this assumed the time and accent of some air. Then he began to whistle softly and hesitatingly, as if trying to recall a forgotten tune. Finally this took shape in a rude resemblance, not unlike that which his flag bore to the national standard, to Yankee Doodle. Suddenly he stopped. There was an unmistakable rapping at the door. The blood, which had at first rushed to his face, now forsook it and settled slowly around his heart. He tried to rise, but could not. Then the door was flung open, and a figure with a scarlet-lined hood and fur mantle stood on a threshold. With a mighty effort he took one stride to the door. The next moment he saw the wide mouth and wide teeth of the princess, and was greeted by a kiss that felt like a baptism. To tear the hood and mantle from her figure in the sudden fury that seized him, and to fiercely demand the reason of this masquerade, was his only return to her greeting. "'Why are you here? Did you steal these garments?' he again demanded in her guttural language, as he shook her roughly by the arm. The princess hung her head. "'Did you?' he screamed, as he reached wildly for his rifle. "'I did.' His hold relaxed, and he staggered back against the wall. The princess began to whimper. Between her sobs, she was trying to explain that the Major and his daughter were going away and that they wanted to send her to the reservation, but he cut her short. "'Take off those things!' The princess tremblingly obeyed. He rolled them up, placed them in the canoe she had just left, and then leaped into the frail craft. She would have followed, but with a great oath he threw her from him and with one stroke of his paddle swept out into the fog and was gone. Jessamy, said the Major, a few days after, as he sat at dinner with his daughter, I think I can tell you something to match the mysterious disappearance and return of your wardrobe. Your crazy friend, the recluse, has enlisted this morning in the 4th Artillery. He's a splendid-looking animal. And there's the right stuff for a soldier in him, if I'm not mistaken. He's in earnest, too, for he enlists in the regiment ordered back to Washington. Bless me, child, another goblet broken. You'll ruin the mess in glassware at this rate. Have you heard anything more of the princess, Papa? Nothing. But perhaps it's as well that she has gone. These cursed settlers are at their old complaints again about what they call Indian depredations, and I have just received orders from headquarters to keep the settlement clear of all vagabond aborigines. I am afraid, my dear, that a strict construction of the term would include your protégé. The time for the departure of the 4th Artillery had come. The night before was thick and foggy. At one o'clock a shot on the ramparts called out the guard and roused the sleeping garrison. The new sentry, Private Gray, had challenged a dusky figure creeping on the glacis, and, receiving no answer, had fired. The guard sent out presently returned, bearing a lifeless figure in their arms. The new sentry's zeal, joined with an ex-frontiersman's aim, was fatal. They laid the helpless, ragged form before the guardhouse door, and then saw for the first time that it was the princess. Presently she opened her eyes. They fell upon the agonized face of her innocent slayer, but happily without intelligence or reproach. Georgie, she whispered. Bob, all same now. Me get plenty well soon. Me make no more fuss. Me go to reservation. 
Then she stopped, a tremor ran through her limbs, and she lay still. She had gone to the reservation. Not that devised by the wisdom of man, but that one set apart from the foundation of the world for the wisest as well as the meanest of his creatures. End of chapter 3「The Iliad of Sandy Bar » Before nine o'clock it was pretty well known all along the river that the two partners of the Amity claim had quarreled and separated at daybreak. At that time the attention of their nearest neighbor had been attracted by the sounds of altercations and two consecutive pistol shots. Running out, he had seen dimly in the gray mist that rose from the river the tall form of Scott, one of the partners, descending the hill toward the canyon. A moment later, York, the other partner, had appeared from the cabin and walked in the opposite direction toward the river, passing within a few feet of the curious watcher. Later it was discovered that a serious Chinaman cutting wood before the cabin had witnessed part of the quarrel but john was stolid indifferent and reticent me choppy wood me no fighty was his serene response to all anxious queries but what did they say john john did not sabby colonel starbottle deftly ran over the various popular epithets which a generous public sentiment might accept as reasonable provocation for an assault. But John did not recognize them. "'And this here's the cattle,' said the Colonel, with some severity, "'that some thinks ought to be allowed to testify again a white man. Get, you heathen!' Still the quarrel remained inexplicable. The two men, whose amiability and grave tact had earned for them the title of the peacemakers in a community not greatly given to the passive virtues, that these men, singularly devoted to each other, should suddenly and violently quarrel might well excite the curiosity of the camp. A few of the more inquisitive visited the lake scene of conflict, now deserted by its former occupants. There was no trace of disorder or confusion in the neat cabin. The rude table was arranged as if for breakfast, the pan of yellow biscuits still sat upon the hearth, whose dead embers might have typified the evil passions that had raged there but an hour before. But Colonel Starbottle's eye, albeit somewhat bloodshot and roomy, was more intent on practical details. On examination, a bullet hole was found in the doorpost, and another, nearly opposite, in the casing of the window. The colonel called attention to the fact that the one agreed with the bore of Scott's revolver and the other with that of York's derringer. "'They must have stood about here,' said the colonel, taking position. "'Not more than three feet apart, and missed.' There was a fine touch of pathos in the falling inflection of the colonel's voice, which was not without effect. A delicate perception of wasted opportunity thrilled his auditors. But the bar was destined to experience a greater disappointment. The two antagonists had not met since the quarrel, and it was vaguely rumored that on the occasion of a second meeting each had determined to kill the other on sight. There was consequently some excitement, and, it is to be feared, no little gratification, when, at ten o'clock, York stepped from the Magnolia Saloon into the one long straggling street of the camp at the same moment that Scott left the blacksmith's shop at the forks of the road. It was evident, at a glance, that a meeting could only be avoided by the actual retreat of one or the other. In an instant the doors and windows of the adjacent saloons were filled with faces, Heads unaccountably appeared above the river banks and from behind boulders. An empty wagon at the crossroad was suddenly crowded with people, who seemed to have sprung from the earth. 
there was much running and confusion on the hillside. On the mountain road, Mr. Jack Hamlin had reined up his horse and was standing upright on the seat of his buggy, and the two objects of this absorbing attention approached each other. York's got the sun. He's got to line him on that tree. He's waiting to draw his fire, came from the cart, and then it was silent. But above this human breathlessness the river rushed and sang, and the wind rustled the treetops with an indifference that seemed obtrusive. Colonel Starbottle felt it, and, in a moment of sublime preoccupation, without looking around, waved his cane behind him warningly to all nature, and said, Shoo! The men were now within a few feet of each other. A hen ran across the road before one of them. A feathery seed vessel, wafted from a wayside tree, fell at the feet of the other. And, unheeding this irony of nature, the two opponents came nearer, erect and rigid, looked into each other's eyes, and passed. Colonel Starbottle had to be lifted from the cart. This air camp is played out, he said gloomily as he affected to be supported into the magnolia. With what further expression he might have indicated his feelings, it was impossible to say, for at that moment Scott joined the group. "'Did you speak to me?' he asked of the colonel, dropping his hand, as if with accidental familiarity, on that gentleman's shoulder. The colonel, recognizing some occult quality in the touch, and some unknown quantity in the glance of his questioner, contented himself by replying, No, sir, with dignity. A few rods away, York's conduct was as characteristic and peculiar. You had a mighty fine chance. Why didn't you plump him? said Jack Hamlin, as York drew near the buggy. Because I hate him, was the reply, heard only by Jack. Contrary to popular belief, this reply was not hissed between the lips of the speaker, but was said in an ordinary tone. But Jack Hamlin, who was an observer of mankind, noticed that the speaker's hands were cold and his lips dry as he helped him into the buggy, and accepted the seeming paradox with a smile. When Sandy Barr became convinced that the quarrel between York and Scott could not be settled after the usual local methods, it gave no further concern thereto. But presently it was rumored that the Amity claim was in litigation, and that its possession would be expensively disputed by each of the partners. As it was well known that the claim in question was worked out and worthless, and that the partners, whom it had already enriched, had talked of abandoning it but a day or two before the quarrel, this proceeding could only be accounted for as gratuitous spite. Later, two San Francisco lawyers made their appearance in this guileless Arcadia, and were eventually taken into the saloons, and, what was pretty much the same thing, the confidences of the inhabitants. The results of this unhallowed intimacy were many subpoenas, and, indeed, when the Amity claim came to trial, all of Sandy Bar that was not in compulsory attendance at the county seat came there from curiosity. The gulches and ditches for miles around were deserted. I do not propose to describe that already famous trial. Enough that, in the language of the plaintiff's counsel, it was one of no ordinary significance involving the inherent rights of that untiring industry which had developed the Pactolian resources of this golden land. And, in the homelier phrase of Colonel Starbottle, a fuss that gentlemen might have settled in ten minutes over a social glass if they meant business, or in ten seconds with a revolver if they meant fun. Scott got a verdict, from which York instantly appealed. It was said that he had sworn to spend his last dollar in the struggle. In this way, Sandy Barr began to accept the enmity of the former partners as a lifelong feud, and the fact that they had ever been friends was forgotten. 
the few who expected to learn from the trial the origin of the quarrel were disappointed. Among the various conjectures, that which ascribed some occult feminine influence as the cause was naturally popular, in a camp given to dubious compliment of the sex. "'My word for it, gentlemen,' said Colonel Starbottle, who had been known in Sacramento as a gentleman of the old school. "'There's some lovely creature at the bottom of this.' The gallant colonel then proceeded to illustrate his theory by divers sprightly stories, such as gentlemen of the old school are in the habit of repeating, but which, from deference to the prejudices of gentlemen of a more recent school, I refrain from transcribing here. But it would appear that even the colonel's theory was fallacious. The only woman who personally might have exercised any influence over the partners was the pretty daughter of old man Follinsby, of Poverty Flat, at whose hospitable house, which exhibited some comforts and refinements rare in that crude civilization, both York and Scott were frequent visitors. Yet into this charming retreat York strode one evening, a month after the quarrel, and, beholding Scott sitting there, turned to the fair hostess with the abrupt query, Do you love this man? The young woman thus addressed returned that answer, at once spirited and evasive, which would occur to most of my fair readers in such an exigency. Without another word, York left the house. Miss Jo heaved the last possible sigh as the door closed on York's curls and square shoulders, and then, like a good girl, turned to her insulted guest. But would you believe it, dear? She afterward related to an intimate friend. The other creature, after glowering at me for a moment, got upon its hind legs, took its hat, and left too. And that's the last I've seen of either. The same hard disregard of all other interests or feelings in the gratification of their blind rancor characterized all their actions. When York purchased the land below Scott's new claim, and obliged the latter, at a great expense, to make a long detour to carry a tail-race around it, Scott retaliated by building a dam that overflowed York's claim on the river. It was Scott who, in conjunction with Colonel Starbottle, first organized that act of opposition to the Chinamen, which resulted in the driving off of York's Mongolian laborers. It was York who built the wagon road and established the express which rendered Scott's mules and pack trains obsolete. It was Scott who called into life the Vigilance Committee which expatriated York's friend Jack Hamlin. It was York who created the Sandy Bar Herald, which characterized the act as a lawless outrage and Scott as a border ruffian. It was Scott, at the head of twenty masked men, who, one moonlight night, threw the offending forms into the yellow river and scattered the types in the dusty road these proceedings were received in the distant and more civilized outlying towns as vague indications of progress and vitality i have before me a copy of the poverty plant pioneer for the week ending august twelfth eighteen fifty six in which the editor under the head of county improvements says the new Presbyterian church on C Street at Sandy Bar is completed. It stands upon the lot formerly occupied by the Magnolia Saloon, which was so mysteriously burnt last month. The temple, which now rises like a phoenix from the ashes of the Magnolia, is virtually the free gift of H. J. York, Esquire, of Sandy Bar, who purchased the lot and donated the lumber. Other buildings are going up in the vicinity, but the most notable is the Sunny South Saloon, erected by Captain Matt Scott, nearly opposite the church. Captain Scott has spared no expense in the furnishing of this saloon, which promises to be one of the most agreeable places of resort in Old Tuolumne. He has recently imported two new first-class billiard tables with cork cushions. Our old friend, Mountain Jimmy, will dispense liquors at the bar. 
we refer our readers to the advertisement in another column. Visitors to Sandy Bar cannot do better than give Jimmy a call. Among the local items occurred the following. H. J. York, Esquire, of Sandy Bar, has offered a reward of one hundred dollars for the detection of the parties who hauled away the steps of the new Presbyterian Church, C Street, Sandy Bar, during divine service on Sabbath evening last. Captain Scott adds another hundred for the capture of the miscreants who broke the magnificent plate-glass windows of the new saloon on the following evening. There is some talk of reorganizing the old vigilance committee at Sandy Bar. When, for many months of cloudless weather, the hard, unwinking sun of Sandy Bar had regularly gone down on the unpacified wrath of these men, there was some talk of mediation. In particular, the pastor of the church to which I have just referred, a sincere, fearless, but perhaps not fully enlightened man, seized gladly upon the occasion of York's liberality to attempt to reunite the former partners. He preached an earnest sermon on the abstract sinfulness of discord and rancor. But the excellent sermons of the Reverend Mr. Dawes were directed to an ideal congregation that did not exist at Sandy Bar, a congregation of beings of unmixed vices and virtues, of single impulses and perfectly logical motives, of preternatural simplicity, of childlike faith and grown-up responsibilities. As, unfortunately, the people who actually attended Mr. Dawes' church were mainly very human, somewhat artful, more self-excusing than self-accusing, rather good-natured, and decidedly weak, they quietly shed that portion of the sermon which referred to themselves, and, excepting York and Scott, who were both in defiant attendance, as curious examples of those ideal beings above referred to, felt a certain satisfaction, which I fear was not altogether Christian-like, in their raking down. If Mr. Dawes expected York and Scott to shake hands after the sermon, he was disappointed. But he did not relax his purpose. With that quiet fearlessness and determination which had won for him the respect of men who were too apt to regard piety as synonymous with effeminacy, he attacked Scott in his own house. What he said has not been recorded, but it is to be feared that it was part of his sermon. When he had concluded, Scott looked at him, not unkindly, over the glasses of his bar, and said, less irreverently than the words might convey, Young man, I rather like your style. But when you know York and me as well as you do God Almighty, it'll be time to talk. And so the feud progressed. And so, as in more illustrious examples, the private and personal enmity of two representative men led gradually to the evolution of some crude, half-expressed principle or belief. It was not long before it was made evident that those beliefs were identical with certain broad principles laid down by the founders of the American Constitution, as expounded by the statesmanlike A, or were the fatal quicksands on which the ship of state might be wrecked, warningly pointed out by the eloquent B. The practical result of all which was the nomination of York and Scott to represent the opposite factions of Sandy Bar in legislative councils. For some weeks past, the voters of Sandy Bar and the adjacent camps had been called upon, in large type, to rally in vain the great pines at the crossroads, whose trunks were compelled to bear this and other legends, moaned and protested from their windy watch-towers. But one day, with fife and drum, and flaming transparency, a procession filed into Triangular Grove at the head of the gulch. The meeting was called to order by Colonel Starbottle, who, having once enjoyed legislative functions, and being vaguely known as a war-horse, was considered to be a valuable partisan of York. He concluded an appeal for his friend with an enunciation of principles, 
interspersed with one or two anecdotes so gratuitously coarse that the very pines might have been moved to pelt him with their cast-off cones as he stood there. But he created a laugh on which his candidate rode into popular notice, and when York rose to speak he was greeted with cheers. But, to the general astonishment, the new speaker at once launched into bitter denunciation of his rival. He not only dwelt upon Scott's deeds and example, as known to Sandy Barr, but spoke of facts connected with his previous career, hitherto unknown to his auditors. To great precision of epithet and directness of statement, the speaker added the fascination of revelation and exposure. The crowd cheered, yelled, and were delighted, but when this astonished philippic was concluded, there was a unanimous call for Scott. Colonel Starbottle would have resisted this manifest impropriety, but in vain. Partly from a crude sense of justice, partly from a meaner craving for excitement, the assemblage was inflexible, and Scott was dragged, pushed, and pulled upon the platform. As his frowsy head and unkempt beard appeared above the railing, it was evident that he was drunk. But it was also evident, before he opened his lips, that the orator of Sandy Bar, the one man who could touch their vagabond sympathies, perhaps because he was not above appealing to them, stood before them. A consciousness of this power lent a certain dignity to his figure, and I am not sure but that his very physical condition impressed them as a kind of regal unbending and large condescension. Howbeit, when this unexpected Hector rose from the ditch, York's myrmidons trembled. "'There's not, gentlemen,' said Scott, leaning forward on the railing. "'There's not that that man has said that isn't true. I was run out of Cairo. I did belong to the regulators. I did desert from the army. I did leave a wife in Kansas. But there's one thing he didn't charge me with and maybe he's forgotten. For three years, gentlemen, I was that man's partner. Whether he intended to say more, I cannot tell. A burst of applause artistically rounded and enforced the climax, and virtually elected the speaker. That fall he went to Sacramento, York went abroad, and for the first time in many years, distance and a new atmosphere isolated the old antagonists. With little of change in the green wood, gray rock, and yellow river, but with much shifting of human landmarks and new faces in its habitations, three years passed over Sandy Bar. The two men, once so identified with its character, seemed to have been quite forgotten. "'You will never return to Sandy Bar.' said Miss Follinsby, the lily of poverty flat, on meeting York in Paris, for Sandy Bar is no more. They call it Riverside now, and the new town is built higher up on the river bank. By the by, Joe says that Scott has won his suit about the Amity claim, and that he lives in the old cabin, and is drunk half his time. Oh, I beg your pardon, added the lively lady, as a flush crossed York's sallow cheek. But, bless me, I really thought that old grudge was made up. I'm sure it ought to be. It was three months after this conversation, and a pleasant summer evening, that the poverty flat coach drew up before the veranda of the Union Hotel at Sandy Bar. Among its passengers was one, apparently a stranger, in the local distinction of well-fitting clothes and closely shaven face, who demanded a private room and retired early to rest. But before sunrise next morning he arose, and drawing some clothes from his carpet-bag, proceeded to array himself in a pair of white duck trousers, a white duck overshirt, and straw hat. When his toilet was completed, he tied a red bandana handkerchief in a loop and threw it loosely over his shoulders. The transformation was complete. As he crept softly down the stairs and stepped into the road, no one would have detected in him the elegant stranger of the previous night, and but few have recognized the face and figure of Henry York of Sandy Bar. 
in the uncertain light of that early hour, and in the change that had come over the settlement, he had to pause for a moment to recall where he stood. The sandy bar of his recollection lay below him, nearer the river. The buildings around him were of later date and newer fashion. As he strode toward the river, he noticed here a schoolhouse and there a church. A little farther on, the sunny south came in view, transformed into a restaurant, its gilding faded and its paint rubbed off. He now knew where he was, and, running briskly down a declivity, crossed a ditch and stood upon the lower boundary of the Amity Claim. The gray mist was rising slowly from the river, clinging to the treetops and drifting up the mountainside, until it was caught among those rocky altars, and held a sacrifice to the ascending sun. At his feet, the earth, cruelly gashed and scarred by his forgotten engines, had, since the old days, put on a show of greenness here and there, and now smiled forgivingly up at him, as if things were not so bad after all. A few birds were bathing in the ditch with a pleasant suggestion of its being a new and special provision of nature, and a hare ran into an inverted sluice-box as he approached, as if it were put there for that purpose. He had not yet dared to look in a certain direction, but the sun was now high enough to paint the little eminence on which the cabin stood. In spite of his self-control, his heart beat faster as he raised his eyes toward it. Its window and door were closed, no smoke came from its adobe chimney, but it was else unchanged. When within a few yards of it, he picked up a broken shovel, and, shouldering it with a smile, strode toward the door and knocked. There was no sound from within. The smile died upon his lips as he nervously pushed the door open. A figure started up angrily and came toward him, a figure whose bloodshot eyes suddenly fixed into a vacant stare, whose arms were at first outstretched and then thrown up in warning gesticulation, a figure that suddenly gasped, choked, and then fell forward in a fit. But before he touched the ground, York had him out in the open air and sunshine. In the struggle, both fell and rolled over on the ground. But the next moment York was sitting up, holding the convulsed frame of his former partner on his knee, and wiping the foam from his inarticulate lips. Gradually the tremor became less frequent, and then ceased, and the strong man lay unconscious in his arms. For some moments York held him quietly thus, looking in his face. Afar, the stroke of a woodman's axe, a mere phantom of sound, was all that broke the stillness. High up the mountain, a wheeling hawk hung breathlessly above them, and then came voices, and two men joined them. A fight? No, a fit, and would they help him bring the sick man to the hotel? And there, for a week, the stricken partner lay, unconscious of aught but the visions wrought by disease and fear. On the eighth day, at sunrise, he rallied, and, opening his eyes, looked upon York, and pressed his hand. Then he spoke. "'And it's you. I thought it was only whiskey.' York replied by taking both of his hands, boyishly working them backward and forward as his elbow rested on the bed, with a pleasant smile. "'And you've been abroad. How did you like Paris?' "'So-so. How did you like Sacramento? Bully. And that was all they could think to say. Presently Scott opened his eyes again. I'm mighty weak. You'll get better soon. Not much. A long silence followed, in which they could hear the sounds of wood chopping, and that sandy bar was already astir for the coming day. Then Scott slowly and with difficulty turned his face to York and said, I might have killed you once. I wish you had. They pressed each other's hands again, but Scott's grasp was evidently failing. He seemed to summon his energies for a special effort. Old man. Old chap. Closer. York bent his head toward the slowly fading face. Do you mind that morning? Yes. A gleam of fun slid into the corner of Scott's blue eye 
as he whispered, Old man, there was too much saleratus in that bread. It is said that these were his last words, for when the sun, which had so often gone down upon the idle wrath of these foolish men, looked again upon them reunited, it saw the hand of Scott fall cold and irresponsive from the yearning clasp of his former partner, and it knew that the feud of Sandy Bar was at an end. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of Mrs. Skaggs' Husbands and Other Stories by Bret Hart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Thompson's Prodigal We all knew that Mr. Thompson was looking for his son, and a pretty bad one at that. That he was coming to California for this sole object was no secret to his fellow passengers and the physical peculiarities as well as the moral weaknesses of the missing prodigal were made equally plain to us through the frank volubility of the parents you were speaking of a young man who was hung at red dog for sluice robbing said mr thompson to a steerage passenger one day be you aware of the color of his eyes black responded the passenger ah said mr thompson referring to some mental memoranda. Charles's eyes was blue. He then walked away. Perhaps it was from this unsympathetic mode of inquiry. Perhaps it was from the Western predilection to take a humorous view of any principle or sentiment persistently brought before them, that Mr. Thompson's quest was the subject of some satire among the passengers. A gratuitous advertisement of the missing Charles, addressed to jailers and guardians, circulated privately among them. Everybody remembered to have met Charles under distressing circumstances. Yet it is but due to my countrymen to state that when it was known that Thompson had embarked some wealth in this visionary project, but little of this satire found its way to his ears and nothing was uttered in his hearing that might bring a pang to a father's heart or imperil a possible pecuniary advantage of the satirist indeed mr bracy tibbets jocular proposition to form a joint stock company to prospect for the missing youth received at one time quite serious entertainment perhaps to superficial criticism mr thompson's nature was not picturesque nor lovable his history, as imparted at dinner one day by himself, was practical even in its singularity. After a hard and willful youth and maturity, in which he had buried a broken-spirited wife and driven his son to sea, he suddenly experienced religion. I got it in New Orleans in 59, said Mr. Thompson, with the general suggestion of referring to an epidemic. Enter ye the narrow gate, purse me the beans. Perhaps this practical quality upheld him in his apparently hopeless search. He had no clue to the whereabouts of his runaway son. Indeed, scarcely a proof of his present existence. From his indifferent recollection of the boy of twelve, he now expected to identify the man of twenty-five. It would seem that he was successful. How he succeeded was one of the few things he did not tell. There are, I believe, two versions of the story. One that Mr. Thompson, visiting a hospital, discovered his son by reason of a peculiar hymn chanted by the sufferer in a delirious dream of his boyhood. This version, giving as it did wide range to the finer feelings of the heart, was quite popular, and, as told by the Reverend Mr. Gushington, on his return from his California tour, never failed to satisfy an audience. The other was less simple, and, as I shall adopt it here, deserves more elaboration. It was after Mr. Thompson had given up searching for his son among the living, and had taken up the examination of cemeteries, and a careful inspection of the cold hick jackets of the dead. At this time he was a frequent visitor of Lone Mountain, a dreary hilltop, bleak enough in its original isolation, 
and bleaker for the white-faced marbles by which San Francisco anchored her departed citizens, and kept them down in a shifting sand that refused to cover them, and against a fierce and persistent wind that strove to blow them utterly away. Against this wind the old man opposed a will quite as persistent, a grizzled hard face and a tall, crepe-bound hat drawn tightly over his eyes, and so spent days in reading the mortuary inscriptions audibly to himself. The frequency of scriptural quotation pleased him, and he was fond of corroborating them by a pocket Bible. "'That's from Psalms,' he said one day to an adjacent gravedigger. The man made no reply. Not at all rebuffed, Mr. Thompson at once slid down into the open grave with a more practical inquiry. "'Did you ever in your profession come across Charles Thompson?' "'Thompson be damned,' said the grave digger with great directness. "'Which, if he had religion, I think he is,' responded the old man as he clambered out of the grave. It was perhaps on this occasion that Mr. Thompson stayed later than usual. As he turned his face toward the city, lights were beginning to twinkle ahead, and a fierce wind, made visible by fog, drove him forward, or, lying in wait, charged him angrily from the corners of deserted suburban streets. It was on one of these corners that something else, quite as indistinct and malevolent, leaped upon him with an oath, a presented pistol, and a demand for money but it was met by a will of iron and a grip of steel. The assailant and assailed rolled together on the ground, but the next moment the old man was erect, one hand grasping the captured pistol and the other clutching at arm's length the throat of a figure, surly, youthful, and savage. "'Young man,' said Thompson, setting his thin lips together, "'what might be your name?' "'Thompson.' The old man's hand slid from the throat to the arm of his prisoner without relaxing its firmness. "'Charles Thompson, come with me,' he said presently, and marched his captive to the hotel. What took place there has not transpired, but it was known the next morning that Mr. Thompson had found his son. It is proper to add to the above improbable story that there was nothing in the young man's appearance or manners to justify it grave, reticent, and handsome, devoted to his newly found parent, he assumed the emoluments and responsibilities of his new condition with a certain serious ease that more nearly approached that which San Francisco society lacked and rejected. Some chose to despise this quality as a tendency to psalm singing. Others saw it in the inherited qualities of the parent, and were ready to prophesy for the son the same hard old age. But all agreed that it was not inconsistent with the habits of money-getting, for which father and son were respected. And yet the old man did not seem to be happy. Perhaps it was that the consummation of his wishes left him without a practical mission. Perhaps, as it is the more probable, he had little love for the son he had regained. The obedience he exacted was freely given, the reform he had set his heart upon was complete, and yet somehow it did not seem to please him. In reclaiming his son he had fulfilled all the requirements that his religious duty required of him, and yet the act seemed to lack sanctification. In this perplexity he read again the parable of the prodigal son, which he had long ago adopted for his guidance, and found that he had omitted the final feast of reconciliation. This seemed to offer the proper quality of ceremoniousness in the sacrament between himself and his son, and so, a year after the appearance of Charles, he set about giving him a party. "'Invite everybody, Charles,' he said dryly. "'Everybody who knows that I brought you out of the wine-husks of iniquity and the company of harlots, and bid them eat, drink, and be merry.' Perhaps the old man had another reason, not yet clearly analyzed. The fine house he had built on the sand hills sometimes seemed lonely and bare. He often found himself trying to reconstruct from the grave features of Charles 
the little boy whom he but dimly remembered in the past, and of whom lately he had been thinking a great deal. He believed this to be a sign of impending old age and childishness. But coming one day in his formal drawing-room, upon a child of one of the servants who had strayed therein, he would have taken him in his arms, but the child fled from before his grizzled face, so that it seemed eminently proper to invite a number of people to his house, and from the array of San Francisco maidenhood to select a daughter-in-law. And then there would be a child, a boy, whom he could rear up from the beginning, and love as he did not love Charles. We were all at the party. The Smiths, Joneses, Browns, and Robinsons also came, in that fine flow of animal spirits, unchecked by any respect for the entertainer, which most of us are apt to find so fascinating. The proceedings would have been somewhat riotous but for the social position of the actors. In fact, Mr. Bracy Tibbets, having naturally a fine appreciation of a humorous situation, but further impelled by the bright eyes of the Jones girls, conducted himself so remarkably as to attract the serious regard of Mr. Charles Thompson, who approached him, saying quietly, "'You look ill, Mr. Tibbets. Let me conduct you to your carriage.' Resist, you hound, and I'll throw you through that window. This way, please. The room is close and distressing. It is hardly necessary to say that but a part of this speech was audible to the company, and that the rest was not divulged by Mr. Tibbets, who afterward regretted the sudden illness which kept him from witnessing a certain amusing incident, which the fastest Miss Jones characterized as the richest part of the blowout and which I hastened to record. It was at supper. It was evident that Mr. Thompson had overlooked much lawlessness in the conduct of the younger people in his abstract contemplation of some impending event. When the cloth was removed, he rose to his feet and grimly tapped upon the table. A titter that broke out among the Jones girls became epidemic on one side of the board. Charles Thompson, from the foot of the table, looked up in tender perplexity. He's going to sing a doxology. He's going to pray. Silence for a speech, ran around the room. It's one year today, Christian brothers and sisters, said Mr. Thompson with grim deliberation. One year today since my son came home from eating of wine husks and spending of his substance on harlot. The tittering suddenly ceased. Look at him now. Charles Thompson, stand up. Charles Thompson stood up. One year ago today, and look at him now. He was certainly a handsome prodigal, standing there in his cheerful evening dress, a repentant prodigal with sad, obedient eyes turned upon the harsh and unsympathetic glance of his father. The youngest Miss Smith, from the pure depths of her foolish little heart, moved unconsciously toward him. "'It's fifteen years ago since he left my house,' said Mr. Thompson. "'A rovier and a prodigal. I was myself a man of sin. O oh, Christian friends, a man of wrath and bitterness. Amen!' from the eldest Miss Smith. "'But praise be God, I fled the wrath to come.' It's five years ago since I got the peace that passeth understanding. Have you got it, friends? A general sub-chorus of No, no, from the girls, and Pass the word for it, from Midshipman Cox of the U.S. Sloop Weathersfield. Knock, and it shall be open to you. And when I found the error of my ways, and the precociousness of grace, continued Mr. Thompson, I came to give it to my son. By sea and land I sought him far, and fainted not. I did not wait for him to come to me, which the same I might have done, and justified myself by the book of books. But I saw him out among his husks, and— The rest of the sentence was lost in the rustling withdrawal of the ladies. Works, Christian friends, is my motto. By their works shall ye know them, and there is mine. The particular and accepted work 
to which Mr. Thompson was alluding, had turned quite pale, and was looking fixedly toward an open door leading to the veranda, lately filled by gaping servants, and now the scene of some vague tumult. As the noise continued, a man, shabbily dressed, and evidently in liquor, broke through the opposing guardians and staggered into the room. The transition from the fog and darkness without to the glare and heat within evidently dazzled and stupefied him. He removed his battered hat and passed it once or twice before his eyes as he steadied himself, but unsuccessfully, by the back of a chair. Suddenly his wandering glance fell upon the pale face of Charles Thompson, and with a gleam of childlike recognition and a weak falsetto laugh, he darted forward, caught at the table, upset the glasses, and literally fell upon the prodigal's breast. Charlie, you damned old scoundrel, how are you? Hush, sit down, hush, said Charles Thompson, hurriedly endeavoring to extricate himself from the embrace of his unexpected guest. Look at him, continued the stranger unheeding the admonition but suddenly holding the unfortunate charles at arm's length in loving and undisguised admiration of his festive appearance <laughs> look at him ain't he nasty Surely i'm proud of you leave the house said mr thompson rising with a dangerous look in his cold gray eye charles how dare you simmer down old man Charlie, who's the old bloat? <laughs> Hush, man. Here, take this. With nervous hands, Charles Thompson filled a glass with liquor. Drink it and go. Until tomorrow. Any time, but leave us. Go now. But even then, ere the miserable wretch could drink, the old man, pale with passion, was upon him. Half carrying him in his powerful arms, half dragging him through the circling crowd of frightened guests he had reached the door swung open by the waiting servants when charles thompson started from a seeming stupor crying stop the old man stopped through the open door the fog and wind drove chilly what does this mean he asked turning a baleful face on charles nothing but stop for god's sake wait till tomorrow but not tonight do not I implore you, do this thing. There was something in the tone of the young man's voice, something perhaps in the contact of the struggling wretch he held in his powerful arms. But a dim, indefinite fear took possession of the old man's heart. Oh, he whispered hoarsely, is this man? Charles did not answer. Stand back there, all of you, thundered Mr. Thompson to the crowding guests around him. Charles, come here, I command you. I, I beg you, tell me, who is this man? Only two persons heard the answer that came faintly from the lips of Charles Thompson. Your son. When day broke over the bleak sand hills, the guests had departed from Mr. Thompson's banquet halls. The light still burned dimly and coldly in the deserted rooms deserted by all but three figures that huddled together in the chill drawing-room as if for warmth one lay in drunken slumber on a couch at his feet sat he who had been known as charles thompson and beside them haggard and shrunken to half his size bowed the figure of mr thompson his gray eye fixed his elbows upon his knees and his hands clasped over his ears as if to shut out the sad entreating voice that seemed to fill the room god knows i did not set about to wilfully deceive the name i gave that night was the first that came into my thought the name of one whom i thought dead the dissolute companion of my shame and when you questioned further i used the knowledge that i gained from him to touch your heart to set me free only i swear for that but when you told me who you were and i first saw the opening of another life before me then then oh sir if i was hungry homeless and reckless when i would have robbed you of your gold i was heartsick helpless and desperate when i would have robbed you of your love the old man stirred not 
From his luxurious couch the newly found prodigal snored peacefully. I had no father I could claim. I never knew a home but this. I was tempted. I have been happy, very happy. He rose and stood before the old man. Do not fear that I shall come between your son and his inheritance. Today I leave this place, never to return. The world is large, sir, and, thanks to your kindness, I now see the way by which an honest livelihood is gained. Goodbye. You will not take my hand? Well, well, goodbye. He turned to go. But when he had reached the door, he suddenly came back, and raising with both hands the grizzled head, he kissed it once and twice. Charles? There was no reply. Charles! The old man rose with a frightened air and tottered feebly to the door. It was open. There came to him the awakened tumult of a great city in which the prodigal's footsteps were lost forever. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Mrs. Skagg's Husbands and Other Stories by Bret Hart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Romance of Madrono Hollow. The latch on the garden gate of the Follinsby Ranch clicked twice. The gate itself was so much in shadow that lovely night that old man Follinsby, sitting on his porch, could distinguish nothing but a tall white hat and beside it a few fluttering ribbons under the pines that marked the entrance. Whether because of this fact, or that he considered a sufficient time had elapsed since the clicking of the latch for more positive disclosure, I do not know. But after a few moments' hesitation he quietly laid aside his pipe and walked slowly down the winding path toward the gate. At the Seanothus hedge he stopped and listened. There was not much to hear. The hat was saying to the ribbons that it was a fine night, and remarking generally upon the clear outline of the Sierras against the blue-black sky. The ribbons, it so appeared, had admired this all the way home, and asked the hat if it had ever seen anything half so lovely as the moonlight on the summit. The hat never had. It recalled some lovely nights in the south in Alabama, in the south of Alabama, was the way the man heard it. But then there were other things that made this night seem so pleasant. The ribbons could not possibly conceive what the hat could be thinking about. At this point there was a pause of which Mr. Follinsby availed himself to walk very grimly and haunchingly down the gravel walk toward the gate. Then the hat was lifted and disappeared in the shadow, and Mr. Follinsby confronted only the half-foolish, half-mischievous, but wholly pretty face of his daughter. It was afterward known to Madrono Hollow that sharp words passed between Miss Joe and the old man, and that the latter coupled the names of one Culpepper Starbottle and his uncle, Colonel Starbottle, with certain uncomplimentary epithets, and that Miss Joe retaliated sharply, her father's blood before her father's face boiled up and proved her truly of his race quoted the blacksmith who leaned toward the noble verse of byron she saw the old man bluff and raised him was the director comment of the college-bred masters meanwhile the subject of these animate versions proceeded slowly along the road to a point where the Follinsby mansion came in view. A long, narrow, white building, unpretentious yet superior to its neighbors, and bearing some evidences of taste and refinement in the vines that clambered over its porch, in its French windows, and the white muslin curtains that kept out the fierce California sun by day and were now touched with silver in the gracious moonlight. Culpepper leaned against the low fence and gazed long and earnestly at the building. Then the moonlight vanished ghost-like from one of the windows, a material glow took its place, and a girlish figure, holding a candle, 
drew the white curtains together. To Culpepper it was a vestal virgin standing before a hallowed shrine. To the prosaic observer, I fear it was only a fair-haired young woman whose wicked black eyes still shone with unfilial warmth. Albeit, when the figure had disappeared, he stepped out briskly into the moonlight of the high road. Here he took off his distinguishing hat to wipe his forehead, and the moon shone full upon his face. It was not an unprepossessing one albeit a trifle too thin and lank and bilious to be altogether pleasant. The cheekbones were prominent, and the black eyes sunken in their orbits. Straight black hair fell slantwise off a high but narrow forehead, and swept part of a hollow cheek. A long black moustache followed the perpendicular curves of his mouth. It was, on the whole, a serious, even quixotic face, but at times it was relieved by a rare smile of such tender and even pathetic sweetness that Miss Joe is reported to have said that, if it would only last through the ceremony, she would have married its possessor on the spot. I once told him so, added that shameless young woman, but the man instantly fell into a settled melancholy and hasn't smiled since. A half mile below the Follinsby Ranch, the white road dipped and was crossed by a trail that ran through the Madrono Hollow. Perhaps because it was a near cut off to the settlement, perhaps from some less practical reason, Culpepper took this trail, and in a few moments stood among the rarely beautiful pines that give their name to the valley. Even in that uncertain light, the weird beauty of the harlequin masqueraders was apparent their red trunks a blush in the moonlight a deep blood-stain in the shadow stood out against the silvery-green foliage it was as if nature in some gracious moment had here caught and crystallized the gypsy memories of the transplanted spaniard to cheer him in his lonely exile as culpepper entered the grove he heard loud voices as he turned toward a clump of trees a figure so bizarre and characteristic that it might have been a resident Daphne, a figure overdressed in crimson silk and lace, with bare brown arms and shoulders, and a wreath of honeysuckle, stepped out of the shadow. It was followed by a man. Culpepper started. To come to the point briefly, he recognized in the man the features of his respected uncle, Colonel Starbottle, in the female, a lady who may be briefly described as one possessing absolutely no claim to an introduction to the polite reader. To hurry over equally unpleasant details, both were evidently under the influence of liquor. From the excited conversation that ensued, Culpepper gathered that some insult had been put upon the lady at a public ball which she had attended that evening, that the colonel, her escort, had failed to resent it with the sanguinary completeness that she desired. I regret that even in a liberal age I may not record the exact and even picturesque language in which this was conveyed to her hearers. Enough that at the close of a fiery peroration, with feminine inconsistency, she flew at the gallant colonel, and would have visited her delayed vengeance upon his luckless head but for the prompt interference of Culpepper. Thwarted in this, she threw herself upon the ground, and then into unpicturesque hysterics. There was a fine moral lesson, not only in this grotesque performance of a sex which cannot afford to be grotesque, but in the ludicrous concern with which it inspired the two men. Culpepper, to whom woman was more or less angelic, was pained and sympathetic. The colonel, to whom she was more or less improper, was exceedingly terrified and embarrassed. Howbeit, the storm was soon over, and after Mistress Dolores had returned a little dagger to its sheath, her garter, she quietly took herself out of Madrono Hollow, and happily out of these pages forever. 
these two men, left to themselves, conversed in low tones. Dawn stole upon them before they separated. The colonel quite sobered and in full possession of his usual jaunty self-assertion. Culpepper, with a baleful glow in his hollow cheek, and in his dark eyes a rising fire. The next morning the general ear of Madrono Hollow was filled with rumors of the colonel's mishap. It was asserted that he had been invited to withdraw his female companion from the floor of the assembly hall at the Independence Hotel, and that, failing to do this, both were expelled. It is to be regretted that in 1854 public opinion was divided in regard to the propriety of this step and that there was some discussion as to the comparative virtue of the ladies who were not expelled. But it was generally conceded that the real casus belli was political. Is this a dash Puritan meeting? had asked the colonel savagely. It's no Pike County shindig, had responded the floor manager cheerfully. You're a yank had screamed the colonel, profanely qualifying the noun. "'Get you bored a ruffian!' was the reply. Such, at least, was the substance of the reports. As, at that sincere epoch, expressions like the above were usually followed by prompt action, a fracas was confidently looked for. Nothing, however, occurred. Colonel Starbottle made his appearance next day upon the streets with somewhat of his usual pomposity, a little restrained by the presence of his nephew, who accompanied him and who, as a universal favorite, also exercised some restraint upon the curious and impertinent. But Culpepper's face wore a look of anxiety quite at variance with his usual grave repose. The Don don't seem to take the old man's setback kindly observed the sympathizing blacksmith. Perhaps he was sweet on Dolores himself, suggested the skeptical expressman. It was a bright morning, a week after this occurrence, that Miss Jo Fallensby stepped from her garden into the road. This time the latch did not click as she cautiously closed the gate behind her. After a moment's irresolution, which would have been awkward but that it was charmingly employed, after the manner of her sex, in adjusting a bow under a dimpled but rather prominent chin, and in pulling down the fingers of a neatly fitting glove, she tripped toward the settlement. Small wonder that a passing teamster drove his six mules into the wayside ditch and imperiled his load to keep the dust from her spotless garments. Small wonder that the lightning express withheld its speed and flash to let her pass, and that the expressman, who had never been known to exchange more than rapid monosyllables with his fellow man, gazed after her with breathless admiration, for she was certainly attractive. In a country where the ornamental sex followed the example of youthful nature, and were prone to overdress and glaring effervescence, Miss Joe's simple and tasteful raiment added much to the physical charm of, if it did not actually suggest a sentiment to, her presence. It is said that Euchre Deck Billy, working in the gulch at the crossing, never saw Miss Follinsby pass, but that he always remarked apologetically to his partner that he believed he must write a letter home. Even Bill Masters, who saw her in Paris presented to the favorable criticism of that most fastidious man, the late Emperor, said that she was stunning, but a big discount on what she was at Madrono Hollow. It was still early morning, but the sun, with California extravagance, had already begun to beat hotly on the little chip hat and blue ribbons, and Miss Joe was obliged to seek the shade of a bypath. Here she received the timid advances of a vagabond yellow dog graciously, until, emboldened by his success, he insisted upon accompanying her, and, becoming slobberingly demonstrative, threatened her spotless skirt with his dusty paws, when she drove him from her with some slight acerbity, 
and a stone which happily fell within fifty feet of its destined mark. Having thus proved her ability to defend herself, with characteristic inconsistency, she took a small panic, and gathering her white skirts in one hand and holding the brim of her hat over her eyes with the other, she ran swiftly at least a hundred yards before she stopped. Then she began picking some ferns and a few wild flowers still spared to the withered fields, and then a sudden distrust of her small ankles seized her, and she inspected them narrowly for those burrs and bugs and snakes which are supposed to lie in wait for helpless womanhood. Then she plucked some golden heads of wild oats, and with a sudden inspiration placed them in her black hair, and then came quite unconsciously upon the trail leading to madrono hollow here she hesitated before her ran the little trail vanishing at last into the bosky depths below the sun was very hot she must be very far from home why should she not rest a while under the shade of a madrono she answered these questions by going there at once after thoroughly exploring the grove and satisfying herself that it contained no other living human creature, she sat down under one of the largest trees, with a satisfactory little sigh. Miss Jo loved the madrono. It was a cleanly tree. No dust ever lay upon its varnished leaves. Its immaculate shade never was known to harbor grub or insect. She looked up at the rosy arms interlocked and arched above her head, she looked down at the delicate ferns and cryptograms at her feet. Something glittered at the root of the tree. She picked it up. It was a bracelet. She examined it carefully for cipher or inscription. There was none. She could not resist a natural desire to clasp it on her arm and to survey it from that advantageous viewpoint. This absorbed her attention for some moments, and when she looked up again she beheld at a little distance Culpepper Starbottle. He was standing where he had halted, with instinctive delicacy, on first discovering her. Indeed, he had even deliberated whether he ought not to go away without disturbing her. But some fascination held him to the spot. Wonderful power of humanity! Far beyond jutted an outlying spur of the Sierra, vast, compact, and silent. Scarcely a hundred yards away, a league-long chasm dropped its sheer walls of granite a thousand feet. On every side rose up the serried ranks of pine trees, in whose close-set files centuries of storm and change had wrought no breach. Yet all this seemed to Culpepper to have been planned by an all-wise providence as the natural background to the figure of a pretty girl in a yellow dress. Although Miss Jo had confidently expected to meet Culpepper somewhere in her ramble, now that he came upon her suddenly she felt disappointed and embarrassed. His manner, too, was more than usually grave and serious, and more than ever seemed to jar upon that audacious levity which was this giddy girl's power and security in a society where all feeling was dangerous. As he approached her she rose to her feet, but almost before she knew it he had taken her hand and drawn her to a seat beside him. This was not what Miss Joe had expected, but nothing is so difficult to predicate as the exact preliminaries of a declaration of love. What did Culpepper say? Nothing, I fear, that will add anything to the wisdom of the reader. Nothing, I fear, that Miss Joe had not heard substantially from other lips before. But there was a certain conviction, fire-speed, and fury in the manner that was deliciously novel to the young lady. It was certainly something to be courted in the nineteenth century with all the passion and extravagance of the sixteenth. It was something to hear, amid the slang of a frontier society, the language of knight-errantry poured into her ear by this lantern-jawed, dark-browed descendant of the cavaliers. I do not know that there was anything more in it. The facts, however, go to show that at a certain point Miss Jo dropped her glove, and that in recovering it Culpepper possessed himself first of her hand 
and then her lips. When they stood up to go, Culpepper had his arm around her waist, and her black hair, with its sheaf of golden oats, rested against the breast pocket of his coat. But even then I do not think her fancy was entirely captive. She took a certain satisfaction in this demonstration of Culpepper's splendid height, and mentally compared it with a former flame, one Lieutenant McMurk, an active but undersized Hector, who subsequently fell a victim to the incautiously composed and monotonous beverages of a frontier garrison. Nor was she so much preoccupied, but that her quick eyes, even while absorbing Culpepper's glances, were yet able to detect, at a distance, the figure of a man approaching. In an instant she slipped out of Culpepper's arm, and whipping her hands behind her, said, There's that horrid man! Culpepper looked up and beheld his respected uncle panting and blowing over the hill. His brow contracted as he turned to Miss Jo. You don't like my uncle? I hate him. Miss Jo was recovering her ready tongue. Culpepper blushed. He would have liked to enter upon some details of the colonel's pedigree and exploits, but there was not time. He only smiled sadly. The smile melted Miss Jo. She held out her hand quickly, and said with even more than her usual effrontery, Don't let that man get you into any trouble. Take care of yourself, dear, and don't let anything happen to you. Miss Jo intended this speech to be pathetic. The tenure of life among her lovers had hitherto been very uncertain. Culpepper turned toward her, but she had already vanished in the thicket. The colonel came up panting. I've looked all over town for you, and be dashed to you, sir. Who was that with you? A lady. Culpepper never lied, but he was discreet. Damn them all! Look here, Culp. I spotted the man who gave the order to pull me off the flow. Flow was what the colonel said. The other night. Who was it? asked Culpepper listlessly. Jack Follinsby. Who? Why, the son of that dashed nigger worshipping psalm singing Puritan Yankee. What's the matter now? Look here, Culp. You ain't going back on your blood, are you? You ain't going back on your word? You ain't going down at the feet of this trash like a whipped hound. Culpepper was silent. He was very white. Presently he looked up and said quietly, No. Culpepper Starbottle had challenged Jack Follinsby, and the challenge was accepted. The cause alleged was the expelling of Culpepper's uncle from the floor of the assembly hall by the order of Follinsby. This much Madrono Hollow knew and could swear to, but there were other strange rumors afloat, of which the blacksmith was an able expounder. You see, gentlemen, he said to the crowd gathered round his anvil, I ain't got no theory of this affair. I only give a few facts as have come to my knowledge. Culpepper and Jack meets quite accidental like in Bob's saloon. Jack goes up to Culpepper and says, A word with you. Culpepper bows and steps aside in this way. Jack's standing about here. The blacksmith demonstrates the position of the parties with two old horseshoes on the anvil. Jack pulls a bracelet from his pocket and says, Do you know that bracelet? Culpepper says, I do not. Quite cool-like and easy. Jack says, you gave it to my sister. Culpepper says, Still cool as you please. I did not. Jack says, You lie, God damn you, and draws his derringer. Culpepper jumps forward about here. Reference is made to the diagram. And Jack fires. Nobody hit. It's a mighty curious thing, gentlemen, continued the blacksmith, dropping suddenly into the abstract, and leaning meditatively on his anvil, it's a mighty curious thing, and nobody gets hit so often. You and me empties our revolvers sociably at each other over a little game, and the room full and nobody gets hit. That's what gets me. Never mind, Thompson, chimed in Bill Masters. 
there's another and better world where we shall know all that and become better shots. Go on with your story. Well, some grabs Culpepper and some grabs Jack, and so separates them. Then Jack tells him as how he had seen his sister wear a bracelet which he knew was one that had been given to Dolores by Colonel Starbottom. That Miss Joe wouldn't say where she got it, but owned up to having seen Culpepper that day. Then, the most curious thing of it yet, what does Culpepper do but rise up and takes all back that he said, and allows that he did give her the bracelet. Now, my opinion, gentlemen, is that he lied. It ain't like that man to give a gal that he respects anything off of that piece to Loris. But it's all the same now, and there's nothing but one thing to be done. The way this one thing was done belongs to the record of Madrono Hollow. The morning was bright and clear, the air was slightly chill, but that was from the mist which arose along the banks of the river. As early as six o'clock, the designated ground, a little opening in the Madrono Grove, was occupied by Culpepper Starbottle, Colonel Starbottle, his second, and the surgeon. The colonel was exalted and excited, albeit in a rather imposing, dignified way, and pointed out to the surgeon the excellence of the ground, which at that hour was wholly shaded from the sun, whose steady stare is more or less discomposing to real duelists. The surgeon threw himself on the grass and smoked his cigar. Culpepper, quiet and thoughtful, leaned against a tree and gazed up the river. There was a strange suggestion of a picnic about the group, which was heightened when the colonel drew a bottle from his coat-tails, and taking a preliminary draught, offered it to the others. Cocktail, sir, he explained with dignified precision. A gentleman, sir, should never go out without him. Keeps off the morning chill. I remember going out in 53 with Hank Boom Pirater. Good catch, sir. The man had to put on his overcoat and was shot in it. Fact. But the noise of wheels drowned the colonel's reminiscences, and a rapidly driven buggy containing Jack Follinsby, Calhoun Bungstarter, his second, and Bill Masters drew up on the ground. Jack Follinsby leaped out gaily. I had the jolliest work to get away without the governor's hearing, he began, addressing the group before him with the greatest volubility. Calhoun Bungstarter touched his arm, and the young man blushed. It was his first duel. If you are ready, gentlemen, said Mr. Bungstarter, we had better proceed to business. I believe it is understood that no apology will be offered or accepted. We may as well settle preliminaries at once, or I fear we shall be interrupted. There is a rumor in town that the Vigilance Committee are seeking our friends the Starbottles, and I believe, as their fellow countrymen, I have the honor to be included in their warrant. At this probability of interruption, that gravity which had hitherto been wanting fell upon the group. The preliminaries were soon arranged, and the principals placed in position. Then there was a silence. To a spectator from the hill, impressed with the picnic suggestion, what might have been the popping of two champagne corks broke the stillness. Culpepper had fired in the air. Colonel Starbottle uttered a low curse. Jack Follinsby sulkily demanded another shot. Again the parties stood opposed to each other. Again the word was given, and what seemed to be the simultaneous report of both pistols rose upon the air. But after an interval of a few seconds all were surprised to see Culpepper slowly raise his unexploded weapon and fire it harmlessly above his head. Then, throwing the pistol upon the ground, he walked to a tree and leaned silently against it. Jack Follinsby flew into a paroxysm of fury. Colonel Starbottle raved and swore. Mr. Bungstarter was properly shocked at their conduct. Really, gentlemen, if Mr. Culpepper Starbottle declines another shot, I do not see how we can proceed. 
But the Colonel's blood was up, and Jack Follinsby was equally implacable. A hurried consultation ensued, which ended by Colonel Starbottle taking his nephew's place as principal, Bill Masters acting as second, vice Mr. Bunkstarter, who declined all further connection with the affair. Two distinct reports rang through the hollow. Jack Follinsby dropped his smoking pistol, took a step forward, and then dropped heavily upon his face. In a moment the surgeon was at his side. The confusion was heightened by the trampling of hoofs and the voice of the blacksmith bidding them flee for their lives before the coming storm. A moment more and the ground was cleared, and the surgeon, looking up, beheld only the white face of Culpepper bending over him. "'Can you save him?' "'I cannot say. Hold up his head a moment while I run to the buggy.' Culpepper passed his arm tenderly around the neck of the insensible man. Presently the surgeon returned with some stimulants. "'There, that will do. Mr. Starmottle, thank you. Now, my advice is to get away from here while you can. I'll look after Follinsby. Do you hear?' Culpepper's arm was still around the neck of his late foe, but his head had dropped and fallen on the wounded man's shoulder. The surgeon looked down, and catching sight of his face, stooped and lifted him gently in his arms. He opened his coat and waistcoat. There was blood upon his shirt, and a bullet hole in his breast. He had been shot unto death at the first fire. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Mrs. Skagg's Husbands and Other Stories by Bret Hart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Poet of Sierra Flat. As the enterprising editor of the Sierra Flat Record stood at his case, setting type for his next week's paper, he could not help hearing the woodpeckers who were busy on the roof above his head. It occurred to him that possibly the birds had not yet learned to recognize in the rude structure any improvement on nature, and this idea pleased him so much that he incorporated it in the editorial article which he was then doubly composing, for the editor was also printer of the record. And although that remarkable journal was reputed to exert a power felt through all Calaveras, and a greater part of Tuolumne County, strict economy was one of the conditions of its beneficent existence. Thus preoccupied, he was startled by the sudden eruption of a small roll of manuscript, which was thrown through the open door and fell at his feet. He walked quickly to the threshold and looked down the tangled trail which led to the high road, but there was nothing to suggest the presence of his mysterious contributor. A hare limped slowly away, a green and gold lizard paused upon a pine stump, the woodpeckers ceased their work. So complete had been his sylvan seclusion that he found it difficult to connect any human agency with the act. Rather, the hare seemed to have an inexpressibly guilty look the woodpeckers to maintain a significant silence, and the lizard to be conscience-stricken into stone. An examination of the manuscript, however, corrected this injustice to defenseless nature. It was evidently of human origin, being verse, and of exceedingly bad quality. The editor laid it aside. As he did so, he thought he saw a face at the window sallying out in some indignation he penetrated the surrounding thicket in every direction but his search was as fruitless as before the poet if it were he was gone a few days after this the editorial seclusion was invaded by voices of alternate expostulation and entreaty stepping to the door the editor was amazed at beholding Mr. Morgan McCorkle, 
a well-known citizen of Angelo, and a subscriber to the record, in the act of urging, partly by force and partly by argument, an awkward young man toward the building. When he had finally effected his object, and, as it were, safely landed his prize in a chair, Mr. McCorkle took off his hat, carefully wiped the narrow isthmus of forehead which divided his black brows from his stubby hair, and with an explanatory wave of his hand toward his reluctant companion, said, A born poet, and the cussedest fool you ever seed. Accepting the editor's smile as a recognition of the introduction, Mr. McCorkle panted and went on. Didn't want to come. Mr. Editor don't want to see me, Morg, says he. Milt, says I, he do. A born poet like you and a gifted genius like he ought to come together sociable. And I fetched him. Ah, will you? The born poet had, after exhibiting signs of great distress, started to run. But Mr. McCorkle was down upon him instantly, seizing him by his long linen coat and settled him back in his chair. "'Tain't no use stampedin'. Here ye are, and here ye stays, for you're a born poet, if ye are as shy as a jackass rabbit. Look at him now." He certainly was not an attractive picture. There was hardly a notable feature in his weak face, except his eyes, which were moist and shy, and not unlike the animal to which Mr. McCorkle had compared him. It was the face that the editor had seen at the window. Knowed him for four a year, since he were a boy, continued Mr. McCorkle in a loud whisper. Always the same, bless you. Can jerk a rhyme as easy as turning jack. Never had any education. Lived out in Missouri all his life. But he's chock full of poetry. Only this morning, says I to him, he camps along with me. Milt, says I, are breakfast ready? And he up and answers back quite peart and chipper. The breakfast it is ready, and the birds is singing free, and it's rising in the dawn and light is happiness to me. When a man, said Mr. McCorkle, dropping his voice with deep solemnity, gets off things like them without any call to do it, and handling flapjacks over a cook stove at the same time, that man's a born poet. There was an awkward pause. Mr. McCorkle beamed patronizingly on his protege. The born poet looked as if he were meditating another flight, not a metaphorical one. The editor asked if he could do anything for them. In course you can, responded Mr. McCorkle. That's just it. Milt, where's that poetry? The editor's countenance fell as the poet produced from his pocket a roll of manuscript. He, however, took it mechanically and glanced over it. It was evidently a duplicate of the former mysterious contribution. The editor then spoke briefly but earnestly. I regret that I cannot recall his exact words, but it appeared that never before in the history of the record had the pressure been so great upon its columns. Matters of paramount importance, deeply affecting the material progress of Sierra, questions touching the absolute integrity of Calaveras and Tuolumne, as social communities were even now waiting expression. Weeks, nay, months must elapse before that pressure would be removed, and the record could grapple with any but the sternest of topics. Again, the editor had noticed with pain the absolute decline of poetry in the foothills of the Sierras. Even the works of Byron and Moore attracted no attention in Dutch Flat, and a prejudice seemed to exist against Tennyson in Grass Valley. But the editor was not without hope for the future. In the course of four or five years, when the country was settled, what would be the cost to print this here? interrupted Mr. McCorkle quietly. About fifty dollars as an advertisement, responded the editor with cheerful alacrity. Mr. McCorkle placed the sum in the editor's hand. 
You see, that's what I says to Milt. Milt, says I, pay as you go, for you are a born poet, having no call to write, but doing it free and spontaneous like, in course you pays. That's why Mr. Editor never printed your poetry. What name shall I put to it? Milton. It was the first word that the born poet had spoken during the interview, and his voice was so very sweet and musical that the editor looked at him curiously and wondered if he had a sister. Milton? Is that all? That's his first name, exclaimed Mr. McCorkle. The editor had suggested that, as there had been another poet of that name, Milt might be took for him. That's bad, reflected Mr. McCorkle with simple gravity. Well, put down his whole name, Milton Chubbuck. The editor made a note of the fact. I'll set it up now, he said. This was also a hint that the interview was ended. The poet and patron, arm in arm, drew towards the door. In next week's paper, said the editor smilingly, in answer to the childlike look of inquiry in the eyes of the poet, and in another moment they were gone. The editor was as good as his word. He straightway betook himself to his case, and unrolling the manuscript began his task. The woodpeckers on the roof recommenced theirs, and in a few moments the former sylvan seclusion was restored. There was no sound in the barren, barn-like room but the birds above, and below the click of the composing rule, as the editor marshaled the types into lines in his stick, and arrayed them in solid column on the galley. Whatever might have been his opinion of the copy before him, there was no indication of it on his face which wore the stolid indifference of his craft. Perhaps this was unfortunate, for as the day wore on and the level rays of the sun began to pierce the adjacent thicket, they sought out and discovered an anxious ambushed figure drawn up beside the editor's window, a figure that had sat there motionless for hours. Within, the editor worked on as steadily and impassively as fate, and without, the born poet of Sierra Flat sat and watched him, as waiting its decree. The effect of the poem on Sierra Flat was remarkable and unprecedented. The absolute vileness of its doggerel, the gratuitous imbecility of its thought, and above all the crowning audacity of the fact that it was the work of a citizen and published in a county paper, brought it instantly into popularity. For many months Calaveras had languished for a sensation. Since the last Vigilance Committee nothing had transpired to dispel the listless ennui begotten of stagnant business and growing civilization. In more prosperous moments the office of the record would have been simply gutted and the editor deported. At present the paper was in such demand that the edition was speedily exhausted. In brief, the poem of Mr. Milton Chubbuck came like a special providence to Sierra Flat. It was read by campfires, in lonely cabins, in flaring barrooms and noisy saloons, and declaimed from the boxes of stagecoaches. It was sung in Poker Flat, with the addition of a local chorus, and danced as an unhallowed rhythmic dance by the Pyrrhic phalanx of One Horse Gulch known as the festive stags of calaveras some unhappy ambiguities of expression gave rise to many new readings notes and commentaries which i regret to state were more often marked by ingenuity than delicacy of thought or expression never before did poet acquire such sudden local reputation from the seclusion of McCorkle's cabin and the obscurity of culinary labors, he was hailed forth into the glowing sunshine of fame. The name of Chubbuck was written in letters of chalk on unpainted walls and carved with a pick on the sides of tunnels. A drink known variously as the Chubbuck Tranquilizer or the Chubbuck Exalter was dispensed at the bars. For some weeks a rude design for a Chubbuck statue, 
made up of illustrations from circus and melodeon posters representing the genius of Calaveras in brief skirts on a flying steed in the act of crowning the poet Chubbuck was visible at Keeler's Ferry. The poet himself was overborne with invitations to drink and extravagant congratulations. The meeting between Colonel Starbottle of Siskian and Chubbuck, as previously arranged by our Boston, late of Roaring Camp, is said to have been indescribably affecting. The colonel embraced him unsteadily. I could not return to my constituents at Siskian, sir, if this hand, which has grasped that of the gifted prentice and the lamented Poe, should not have been honored by the touch of the godlike Chubbuck. Gentlemen, American literature is looking up. Thank you. I will take sugar in mine. It was Boston who indicted letters of congratulation from H. W. Longfellow, Tennyson, and Browning to Mr. Chubbuck, deposited them in the Sierra Flat Post Office, and obligingly consented to dictate the replies. The simple faith and unaffected delight with which these manifestations were received by the poet and his patron might have touched the hearts of these grim masters of irony, but for the sudden and equal development in both of the variety of weak natures. Mr. McCorkle basked in the popularity of his protégé, and became alternately supercilious or patronizing toward the dwellers of Sierra Flat, while the poet, with hair carefully oiled and curled, and bedecked with cheap jewelry and flaunting neck handkerchief, paraded himself before the single hotel. As may be imagined, this new disclosure of weakness afforded intense satisfaction to Sierra Flat, gave another lease of popularity to the poet, and suggested another idea to the facetious Boston. At that time, a young lady popularly and professionally known as the California Pet was performing to enthusiastic audiences in the interior. Her specialty lay in the personation of youthful masculine character. As a gamin of the street, she was irresistible. As a negro dancer, she carried the honest miner's heart by storm. A saucy, pretty brunette, she had preserved a wonderful moral reputation even under the Jove-like advances of showers of gold that greeted her appearance on the stage at Sierra Flat. A prominent and delighted member of that audience was Milton Chubbuck. He attended every night. Every day he lingered at the door of the Union Hotel for a glimpse of the California pet. It was not long before he received a note from her, in Boston's most popular and approved female hand, acknowledging his admiration. It was not long before Boston was called upon to indict a suitable reply. At last, in furtherance of his facetious design, it became necessary for Boston to call upon the young actress herself and secure her personal participation. To her he unfolded a plan, the successful carrying out of which he felt would secure his fame to posterity as a practical humorist. The California pet's black eyes sparkled approvingly and mischievously. She only stipulated that she should see the man first, a concession to her feminine weakness which years of dancing juba and wearing trousers and boots had not wholly eradicated from her willful breast. By all means, it should be done, and the interview was arranged for the next week. It must not be supposed that during this interval of popularity Mr. Chubbuck had been unmindful of his poetic qualities. A certain portion of each day he was absent from town, a communion with nature, as Mr. McCorkle expressed it, and actually wandering in the mountain trails, or lying on his back under the trees, or gathering fragrant herbs and the bright-colored berries of the Marzanita. These and his company he generally brought to the editor's office, late in the afternoon, often to that entertaining journalist's infinite weariness quiet and uncommunicative, 
he would sit there patiently watching him at his work until the hour for closing the office arrived, when he would as quietly depart. There was something so humble and unobtrusive in these visits that the editor could not find it in his heart to deny them, and accepting them, like the woodpeckers, as a part of his sylvan surroundings, often forgot even his presence. Once or twice, moved by some beauty of expression in the moist, shy eyes, he felt like seriously admonishing his visitor of his idle folly. But his glance falling upon the oiled hair and the gorgeous necktie, he invariably thought better of it. The case was evidently hopeless. The interview between Mr. Chubbuck and the California pet took place in a private room of the Union Hotel, propriety being respected by the presence of that arch-humorist, Boston. To this gentleman we are indebted for the only true account of the meeting. However reticent Mr. Chubbuck might have been in the presence of his own sex, toward the fairer portion of humanity he was, like most poets, exceedingly voluble. Accustomed as the California pet had been to excessive compliment, she was fairly embarrassed by the extravagant praises of her visitor. Her personation of boy characters, her dancing of the champion jig, were particularly dwelt upon with fervid but unmistakable admiration. At last, recovering her audacity and emboldened by the presence of Boston, the California pet electrified her ears by demanding, half jestingly, half viciously, if it were as a boy or a girl that she was the subject of his flattering admiration. That knocked him out of time, said the delighted Boston, in his subsequent account of the interview. But do you believe the damn fool actually asked her to take him with her? Wanted to engage in the company? The plan as briefly unfolded by Boston, was to prevail upon Mr. Chubbuck to make his appearance in costume, already designed and prepared by the inventor, before a Sierra Flat audience, and recite an original poem at the hall immediately on the conclusion of the California Pet's performance. At a given signal, the audience were to rise and deliver a volley of unsavory articles, previously provided by the originator of the scheme, then a select few were to rush on the stage, seize the poet, and, after marching him in triumphal procession through town, were to deposit him beyond its uttermost limits, with strict injunctions never to enter it again. To the first part of the plan the poet was committed. For the latter portion it was easy enough to find participants. The eventful night came, and with it an audience that packed the long narrow room with one dense mass of human beings. The California pet never had been so joyous, so reckless, so fascinating and audacious before. But the applause was tame and weak compared to the ironical outburst that greeted the second rising of the curtain and the entrance of the born poet of Sierra Flat. Then there was a hush of expectancy and the poet stepped to the footlights and stood with his manuscript in his hand. His face was deadly pale. Either there was some suggestion of his fate in the faces of his audience, or some mysterious instinct told him of his danger. He attempted to speak, but faltered, tottered, and staggered to the wings. Fearful of losing his prey, Boston gave the signal and leaped upon the stage. But at the same moment a light figure darted from behind the scenes, and, delivering a kick that sent the discomfited humorist back among the musicians, cut a pigeon wing, executed a double shuffle, and then advancing to the footlights with that inimitable look, that audacious swagger and utter abandon which had so thrilled and fascinated them a moment before, uttered the characteristic speech, what are you trying to hit a man for when he's down, say? The look, the drawl, the action, the readiness, and above all the downright courage of the little woman had its effect. A roar of sympathetic applause followed the act. Cut and run while you can, 
she whispered hurriedly over one shoulder, without altering the other's attitude of pert and saucy defiance toward the audience. But even as she spoke, the poet tottered and sank fainting upon the stage. Then she threw a despairing whisper behind the scenes. Ring down the curtain! There was a slight movement of opposition in the audience, but among them rose the burly shoulders of Yuba Bill, the tall erect figure of Henry York of Sandy Bar, and the colorless determined face of John Oakhurst. The curtain came down. Behind it knelt the California pet beside the prostrate poet. Bring me some water. Run for our doctor. Stop. Clear out. Haul ya. She had unloosed the gaudy cravat and opened the shirt collar of the insensible figure before her. Then she burst into an hysterical laugh. Manuela! Her tiring woman, a Mexican half-breed, came toward her. Help me with him to my dressing room, quick. Then stand outside and wait. If anyone questions you, tell him he's gone. Do you hear? He's gone. The old woman did as she was bade. In a few moments the audience had departed. Before morning, so also had the California pet, Manuela, and the poet of Sierra Flat. But, alas, with them also had departed the fair fame of the California pet. Only a few, and these it is to be feared of not the best moral character themselves, still had faith in the stainless honor of their favorite actress. It was a mighty foolish thing to do, but it'll all come out right yet. On the other hand, a majority gave her full credit and approbation for her undoubted pluck and gallantry, but deplored that she should have thrown it away upon a worthless object. To elect for a lover the despised and ridiculed vagrant of Sierra Flat who had not even the manliness to stand up in his own defense, was not only evidence of inherent moral depravity, but was an insult to the community. Colonel Starbottle saw in it only another instance of the extreme frailty of the sex. He had known similar cases, and remembered distinctly, sir, how a well-known Philadelphia heiress, one of the finest women that ever rode in her carriage, that gad, sir, had thrown over a southern member of Congress to consort with a damned nigger. The colonel had also noticed a singular look in the dog's eye, which he did not entirely fancy. He would not say anything against the lady, sir, but he had noticed, and here, happily, the colonel became so mysterious and darkly confidential as to be unintelligible and inaudible to the bystanders. A few days after the disappearance of Mr. Chubbuck, a singular report reached Sierra Flat, and it was noticed that Boston, who since the failure of his elaborate joke had been even more depressed in spirits than is habitual with great humorists, suddenly found that his presence was required in San Francisco. But as yet nothing but the vaguest surmises were afloat, and nothing definite was known. It was a pleasant afternoon when the editor of the Sierra Flat Record looked up from his case and beheld the figure of Mr. Morgan McCorkle standing in the doorway. There was a distressed look on the face of that worthy gentleman that at once enlisted the editor's sympathizing attention. He held an open letter in his hand as he advanced toward the middle of the room. "'As a man that has always borne a fair reputation,' began Mr. McCorkle slowly, "'I should like, if it be as I could, Mr. Editor, to make a correction to the columns of your valuable paper.' The editor begged him to proceed. "'You may not disremember that about a month ago I fetched here what so be as well call a young man whose name might be, as it were, Milton, Milton Chubbuck, Mr. Editor remembered perfectly. That same party I'd knowed better nor for a year, two of em camping out together. Not that I'd known him all the time, 
for he were shy and strange at spells, and had odd ways that I took were natural to a born poet. You may remember that I said he was a born poet? The editor distinctly did. I picked this same party up in St. Joe, taking a fancy to his face, and kind of calculating he'd run away from home. For I'm a married man, Mr. Editor, and have children of my own, and thinking be like he was a born poet. Well, said the editor, and as I said before, I should like now to make a correction in the columns of your valuable paper. What correction? asked the editor. I said, if you remember my words, as how he was a born poet? Yes. From statements in this ere letter, it seems as how I were wrong. Well. She were a woman. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Mrs. Skagg's Husbands and Other Stories by Bret Hart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Christmas Gift that Came to Rupert. A Story for Little Soldiers. It was the Christmas season in California, a season of falling rain and springing grasses. There were intervals when, through driving clouds and flying scud, the sun visited the haggard hills with a miracle, and death and resurrection were as one, and out of the very throes of decay a joyous life struggled outward and upward. Even the storms that swept down the dead leaves nurtured the tender buds that took their places. There were no episodes of snowy silence. Over the quickening fields the farmer's plowshare hard followed the furrows left by the latest rains. Perhaps it was for this reason that the Christmas evergreens which decorated the drawing-room took upon themselves a foreign aspect, and offered a weird contrast to the roses, seen dimly through the windows, as the southwest wind beat their soft faces against the panes. Now, said the doctor, drawing his chair closer to the fire, and looking mildly but firmly at the semicircle of flaxen heads around him, I want it distinctly understood, before I begin my story, that I am not to be interrupted by any ridiculous questions. At the first one I shall stop. At the second I shall feel it my duty to administer a dose of castor oil all around. The boy that moves his legs or arms will be understood to invite amputation. I have brought my instruments with me, and never allow pleasure to interfere with my business. Do you promise? Yes, sir, said six small voices simultaneously. The volley was, however, followed by half a dozen dropping questions. Silence! Bob, put your feet down, and stop rattling that sword. Flora shall sit by my side, like a little lady, and be an example to the rest. Fung Tang shall stay too, if he likes. Now, turn down the gas a little. There, that will do. Just enough to make the fire look brighter and to show off the Christmas candles. Silence, everybody. The boy who cracks an almond or breathes too loud over his raisins will be put out of the room. There was a profound silence. Bob laid his sword tenderly aside and nursed his leg thoughtfully. Flora, after coquettishly adjusting the pocket of her little apron, put her arm upon the doctor's shoulder and permitted herself to be drawn beside him. Fung Tang, the little heathen page, who was permitted on this rare occasion to share the Christian revels in the drawing-room, surveyed the group with a smile that was at once sweet and philosophical. The light ticking of a French clock on the mantel, supported by a young shepherdess of bronze complexion and great symmetry of limb, was the only sound that disturbed the Christmas-like peace of the apartment, a peace which held the odors of evergreens, new toys, cedar boxes, glue, and varnish, 
in an harmonious combination that passed all understanding. About four years ago, at this time, began the doctor, I attended a course of lectures in a certain city. One of the professors, who was a sociable, kindly man, though somewhat practical and hard-headed, invited me to his house on Christmas night. I was very glad to go, as I was anxious to see one of his sons, who, though only twelve years old, was said to be very clever. I dare not tell you how many Latin verses this little fellow could recite, or how many English ones he had composed. In the first place, you'd want me to repeat them. Secondly, I'm not a judge of poetry, Latin or English. But there were judges who said they were wonderful for a boy, and everybody predicted a splendid future for him, everybody but his father. He shook his head doubtingly whenever it was mentioned, for, as I have told you, he was a practical, matter-of-fact man. There was a pleasant party at the professor's that night. All the children of the neighborhood were there, and among them the professor's clever son, Rupert, as they called him, a thin little chap, about as tall as Bobby there, and as fair and delicate as Flora by my side. His health was feeble, his father said. He seldom ran about and played with other boys, preferring to stay at home and brood over his books, and compose what he called his verses. Well, we had a Christmas tree just like this, and we had been laughing and talking, calling off the names of the children who had presents on the tree, and everybody was very happy and joyous when one of the children suddenly uttered a cry of mingled surprise and hilarity, and said, Here's something for Rupert, and what do you think it is? We all guessed. A desk, a copy of Milton, a gold pen, a rhyming dictionary. No, what then? A drum. A what? asked everybody. A drum with Rupert's name on it. Sure enough, there it was, a good-sized, bright, new, brass-bound drum, with a slip of paper on it with the inscription, For Rupert. Of course, we all laughed, and thought it a good joke. You see, you're to make a noise in the world, Rupert, said one. Here's parchment for the poet, said another. Rupert's last work in sheepskin covers, said a third. Give us a classical tune, Rupert, said a fourth, and so on. But Rupert seemed too mortified to speak. He changed color, bit his lips, and finally burst into a passionate fit of crying, and left the room. Then those who had joked him felt ashamed, and everybody began to ask who had put the drum there. But no one knew or if they did, the unexpected sympathy awakened for the sensitive boy kept them silent. Even the servants were called up and questioned, but no one could give any idea where it came from. And what was still more singular, everybody declared that up to the moment it was produced, no one had seen it hanging on the tree. What do I think? Well... I have my own opinion, but no questions. Enough for you to know that Rupert did not come downstairs again that night, and the party soon after broke up. I had almost forgotten those things, for the war of the rebellion broke out the next spring, and I was appointed surgeon in one of the new regiments, and was on my way to the seat of war but I had to pass through the city where the professor lived, and there I met him. My first question was about Rupert. The professor shook his head sadly. He's not well, he said. He has been declining since last Christmas when you saw him. A very strange case, he added, giving it a long Latin name. A very singular case. But go and see him yourself, he urged. 
it may distract his mind and do him good. I went according to the professor's house, and found Rupert lying on a sofa, propped up with pillows. Around him were scattered his books, and what seemed, in singular contrast, that drum I told you about was hanging on a nail just above his head. His face was thin and wasted. There was a red spot on either cheek, and his eyes were very bright and widely opened. He was glad to see me, and when I told him where I was going, he asked a thousand questions about the war. I thought I had thoroughly diverted his mind from its sick and languid fancies when he suddenly grasped my hand and drew me toward him. "'Doctor,' said he, in a low whisper, "'you won't laugh at me if I tell you something?' "'No, certainly not,' I said. "'You remember that drum?' he said, pointing to the glittering toy that hung against the wall. You know, too, how it came to me. A few weeks after Christmas I was lying half asleep here, and the drum was hanging on the wall, when suddenly I heard it beaten. At first, low and slowly, then faster and louder, until its rolling filled the house. In the middle of the night I heard it again. I did not dare to tell anybody about it, but I have heard it every night ever since. He paused and looked anxiously in my face. Sometimes, he continued, it is played softly, sometimes loudly, but always quickening to a long roll, so loud and alarming that I have looked to see people coming into my room to ask what was the matter. But I think, doctor, I think, he repeated slowly, looking up with painful interest into my face, that no one hears it but myself. I thought so, too, but I asked him if he had heard it at any other time. Once or twice in the daytime, he replied, when I have been reading or writing, then very loudly, as though it were angry and tried in that way to attract my attention away from the books. I looked into his face and placed my hand upon his pulse. His eyes were very bright, and his pulse a little flurried and quick. I then tried to explain to him that he was very weak, and that his senses were very acute, as most weak people's are, and how that when he read, or grew interested and excited, or when he was tired at night, the throbbing of a big artery made the beating sound he heard. He listened to me with a sad smile of unbelief, but thanked me, and in a little while I went away. But as I was going downstairs, I met the professor. I gave him my opinion of the case. Well, no matter what it was. He wants fresh air and exercise, said the professor and some practical experience of life, sir. The professor was not a bad man, but he was a little worried and impatient, and thought, as clever people are apt to think, that things which he didn't understand were either silly or improper. I left the city that very day, and in the excitement of battlefields and hospitals I forgot all about little Rupert nor did I hear of him again until one day, meeting an old classmate in the army who had known the professor, he told me that Rupert had become quite insane, and that in one of his paroxysms he had escaped from the house, and as he had never been found, it was feared that he had fallen in the river and was drowned. I was terribly shocked for the moment, as you might imagine, but, dear me, I was living just then among scenes as terrible and shocking, and I had little time to spare to mourn over poor Rupert. It was not long after receiving this intelligence that we had a terrible battle, in which a portion of our army was surprised and driven back with great slaughter. I was detached from my brigade to ride over to the battlefield and assist the surgeons of the beaten division who had more on their hands than they could attend to. When I reached the barn that served for a temporary hospital, I went at once to work. 
Ah, Bob, said the doctor, thoughtfully taking the bright sword from the hands of the half-frightened Bob and holding it gravely before him. These pretty playthings are symbols of cruel, ugly realities. I turned to a tall, stout Vermonter. He continued very slowly, tracing a pattern on the rug with the point of the scabbard, who was badly wounded in both thighs, but he held up his hands and begged me to help others first who needed it more than he. I did not at first heed his request, for this kind of unselfishness was very common in the army. But he went on, For God's sake, doctor, leave me here. There is a drummer boy of our regiment, a mere child, dying, if he isn't dead now. Go and see him first. He lies over there. He saved more than one life. He was at his post in the panic this morning, and saved the honor of the regiment. I was so much more impressed by the man's manner than by the substance of his speech, which was, however, corroborated by the other poor fellow stretched around me, that I passed over to where the drummer lay with his drum beside him. I gave one glance at his face, and yes, Bob, yes, my children, it was Rupert. Well, well. It needed not the chalked cross which my brother surgeons had left upon the rough board whereon he lay to show how urgent was the relief he sought. It needed not the prophetic words of the Vermonter, nor the damp that mingled with the brown curls that clung to his pale forehead to show how hopeless it was now. I called him by name. He opened his eyes larger, I thought, in the new vision that was beginning to dawn upon him, and recognized me. He whispered, I'm glad you have come, but I don't think you can do me any good. I could not tell him a lie. I could not say anything. I only pressed his hand in mine as he went on. But you will see, father, and ask him to forgive me. Nothing is to blame but myself. It was a long time before I understood why the drum came to me that Christmas night, and why it kept calling to me every night, and what it said. I know it now. The work is done, and I am content. Tell father, it is better as it is. I should have lived only to worry and perplex him, and something in me tells me this is right. He lay still for a moment, and then, grasping my hand, said, Hark! I listened, but heard nothing but the suppressed moans of the wounded men around me. The drum, he said faintly, don't you hear it? The drum is calling me. He reached out his arm to where it lay, as though he would embrace it. Listen, he went on. It's the reveille. There are the ranks drawn up in review. Don't you see the sunlight flash down the long line of bayonets? Their faces are shining. They present arms. There comes the general. But his face I cannot look at, for the glory round his head. He sees me. He smiles. It is. And with a name upon his lips that he had learned long ago, he stretched himself wearily upon the planks and lay quite still. That's all. No questions now. Never mind what became of the drum. Who's that sniveling? Bless my soul, where's my pill box? End of chapter 8 End of Mrs. Skagg's Husbands by Bret Hart Recording by Nick Bulka, New Boston, New Hampshire.